All righty then. Are we uh, all set up for the streaming and so forth? Yes, Mayor, we are. Excellent. Well, look at that. Yeah, why is that happening? Well, Center stage. We get we get to distract everyone with the handsome, and then you know it will. Anyways, uh, <laughs> it's Tuesday, March first, twenty twenty two, of our regular council meeting, uh, calling to order. Uh, notice to the public that we uh, may vote, city council may vote to go into executive session uh, for legal advice on any of the agendized items. Uh, roll call, please. Mayor DC. Here. Vice Mayor Daggett. Here. Council Member Aslan. Present. Council Member McCarthy. Here. Council Member Salas. Present. Council Member Shimoni. Here. Council Member Sweet. Here. Thank you. Um, Council Member Salas, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And um, Council Member Sweet, our mission statement, please. The mission of the City of Flagstaff is to protect and enhance the quality of life for all. Thank you. And uh, Vice Mayor, our land acknowledgement. The Flagstaff City Council humbly acknowledges the ancestral homelands of the area's indigenous nations and original stewards. These lands still <laughs> inhabited by native descendants border mountains sacred to indigenous peoples. We honor them, their legacies, their traditions, and their continued contributions. We celebrate their past, present, and future generations who will, ever, who will forever know this place as home. Thank you, and uh, do have a public participant here for agenda item number four, Dan Folk. Nolte. Maybe I'll start over. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> I could hear it just fine in my head. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, uh, Mayor Deasy, Vice Mayor Daggett, and Council Members. I'm Dan Folt, Community Development Director for the City, and I'm here this afternoon to introduce Michelle McNulty. She is our Planning Director, who started back on January 10th, so we're coming up on about eight weeks of her being here in Flagstaff. Uh, Michelle relocated to Flagstaff from Anchorage, Alaska, where she was serving as the planning director for the municipality of Anchorage. Uh, prior to that, she worked for a, a private firm in Anchorage. So she was there for about 13 years in Anchorage. Uh, she graduated from NAU in 2007 with a master's degree in rural geography and planning. And so she was in Flagstaff for two years while she was in the master's program she actually interned for the city of Flagstaff in the comprehensive planning program with Kim Sharp in 2007. And she worked at the visitor center for a couple years. So she's very familiar with Flagstaff. Uh, prior to coming to Flagstaff, she graduated from Ohio State University. I should say the Ohio State University uh, with a degree in cultural anthropology. So we're really excited to have Michelle here, uh, the planning department includes current planning, comprehensive planning, and the zoning code manager. And so with that, uh, I just want to welcome Michelle and uh, invite you to come and say hi to her sometime when you're in City Hall. Okay. Awesome. Michelle, did you want to say anything? No, I'll just say hi, and uh, it's nice to meet all of you in, in person. I've had the opportunity to watch several council meetings. I look forward to working with you, and... Um, I'm excited to be back. It's great to be back, you know, go to interview and come back and be in this position. And um, I do want to give a shout out. I'm excited to be here with such an amazing staff. I know a lot of you have worked with the different planners in the department. And uh, I know I couldn't ask to be part of a better team. So really excited to be here. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle, and welcome. I, I'm, I hear a lot of great things. So Thank I'm you. very excited for you to be a part of the team. 
All right, do we have some electronic participants? Yep. That's what I thought. I saw the One yellow moment, flag please. back there. Mayor and Council, I have Don Rodriguez. Don Rodriguez, you can go ahead and address Mayor and Council. Mayor, do you see Vice Mayor Daggett, Council, thank you for your attention. As a reminder, the Council requested that a future meeting cover the issue of what happens when residents take measures into our own hands and how that can have inverse impacts. This weekend, our family participated in a national CERT training from the county. CERT cites specific laws to protect participants, and they spend time educating the class about not going above their training. Individuals need peace of mind that they can defend themselves when they get sued, which is why they provide the handbook. Our family always searches out professionals and studies information available in order to act according to the constraints of our lives while not impeding on the lives of others. We are asking the city for three considerations. The first one is to stand by basic how-to information that is available, and if it changes, don't delete it from the website and explain why it changed. The statement that every disaster is different is true, but the basics are the same. Honest discussions will recognize this distinction. Number two, continue to pick up the slack where partners are lacking. As partners, you need to have a unified message and hold each other accountable instead of blaming each other. Not every employee agrees with the policies because they don't have enough knowledge. So please train employees to understand what message they need to convey before you send them door to door. Give more detailed information. This is the third one, not broad statements. The county is mistakenly applying their Schultz fire experience to city laws in two ways. The first way is that the county said there are laws for not putting up sandbags on our property. What laws specifically? How does this law apply to disabled residents who can't call over sandbags what about residents who struggle to haul trash cans over their sandbags twice a week or move sandbags daily to go to work, doctor's appointments, and driving kids to school? What about the residents who have flood insurance and just don't care about their neighbors, so don't follow the instructions of the engineers on mitigating with sandbags, even though their lack of action floods their neighbors, homes, and yards? The county says that no wall should be built while at the same time saying that the flooding should not stop construction. The city should discuss this with the county and explain to them why residents are being encouraged to build the walls. Hopefully we can have an honest, objective, and clear discussion at the next update meeting. Thank you for your progress. Um, as I stated last week, the community will benefit by all the work that they've done, like with the sirens and the website and the communication um, has really improved. And I know that this isn't a great situation and we're gonna be going through it again here real soon. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that it's gonna be better. So let's just keep moving forward while learning from our past experiences. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Don, we, we appreciate you. Do we have any other public participation participants at this time? Nope, that was our last one. Okay, thank you. We are down to proclamations and recognitions, and this is the proclamation for Employee Appreciation Day. And though we don't have a direct person to uh, give it to, I would like if council could come convene at the front because this is this is an important one for our employees. Alrighty, the champions of Team Flagstaff would like to acknowledge all city employees for their hard work and dedication to making the city better. The mission of champions of Team Flagstaff is to enhance the culture and environment for city of Flagstaff employees through encouraging engagement, feedback, and communication within the organization. Thank you for being a team, and we can always count on. We are so grateful for all of your hard work and thank you for everything that you do. 
We would like to dedicate Employee Appreciation Day to Team Flagstaff and take time to appreciate our employees' hard work. Therefore, I am Mayor Paul Deasy, Mayor of the City of Flagstaff, Arizona, do hereby proclaim March 4th, 2022 as Employee Appreciation Day. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to all of our employees. This brings us down to agenda item six, our uh, city manager report. City manager. Thank you, Mayor, Council. Good afternoon. Thank you for that recognition. I think we'll be running with that theme here for a while. Um, the manager's report is a little bit voluminous this time, and I want to spend some time with it. I apologize in advance. Uh, there's a lot to share with you. Um, I also want to apologize that it was a little bit of a late report getting to you. It was not in your packet. We worked on it over the weekend and uh, it came to you this morning. So I would invite you, I'll give you a high level review, but I would invite you to give it a read at your leisure as always. Uh, I'd like to start by making an introduction. Um, I am not accompanied by Sterling Solomon here. But <laughs> But uh, I know Sterling is online. Rather, I am accompanied by a fellow employee, Krista Devlin, who works with our management services. Uh, and Krista is endeavoring to uh, pursue or heighten her career path uh, and is looking at potentially um, going for a master's of public administration and has been shadowing a few of us in that regard to see what it's like to work in the city manager's office or other leadership positions. She's spent time with various other leaders. We're quite pleased to see that happen. Uh, so today she was with me at our budget meetings. She sat in on the uh, uh, staff meeting regarding the citizen bond committee. And now she's in front of the city council. So feel free to ask her very tough questions. Uh, she's pretty sharp at any rate. Um, that is uh, who is sitting next to me, and it's a pleasure to have you here, Krista. On to the manager's report. Um, as I mentioned a few weeks back, we're going to start this report again on, on the theme of employee recognition by uh, going through a number of work anniversaries. I think Shannon and I uh, will do a tag team on this because there's quite a few Usually we have a PowerPoint, but because I was so delinquent with my uh, report, uh, we're, we're just gonna kind of scroll through this if, if we can. Stacy, are we able to uh, scroll through the report as I mentioned names, or should I just wing it? Okay, you are fine. Shannon, I see you on the screen, so I might start off with the five-year anniversaries. Council, this is for both January and February, so we're getting caught up here. And then Shannon, I can have you uh, speak to the 10 and 15 year recipients. And I'll jump back in to the 20 year recipient and then you and I can do a little tag team on these significant anniversaries, 25 years and above. So uh, council you have uh, in front of you in the five year category, uh, we have, now I always hope I get these names right, uh, Elizabeth Verstrate or Vistrati, IT administrator um, celebrating her fifth year anniversary, as well as Brian Sutter. He's with our public works. He's a public works supervisor. Happy anniversary to you. Colleen Calhoun, administrative specialist, also celebrating her fifth year. Christopher Palmer, project manager. Same comment, uh, Matthew Black, who is a water s services operator too, um, celebrating his fifth year work anniversary. Lorraine Martinez Buell, finance specialist. Uh, Benjamin Jones, construction inspector. It's a long list. And then uh, Jenny Newman, uh, our climate program manager. 
uh, all of these wonderful individuals uh, celebrating their fifth year anniversary. Shannon, you want to touch on the 10 year work anniversaries? Happy to do so, Greg. Thank you. Um, so first in 10 years, we have Lyle Kenefick. Uh, he is part of our streets team as an operations technician. Uh, in 15 years, we have Gino Leone. He is one of our parks supervisors uh, in our pros division. Uh, you know Nicole Antonopoulos. Uh, she uh, presents to council fairly regularly. She is our sustainability director. Um, Sergeant Ryan Turley uh, is also celebrating 15 years uh, in January. Uh, we have Brian George, uh, who is part of our facility maintenance team as a technician three. Uh, and Dustin Coons is also one of our police sergeants at the Flagstaff Police Department. Uh, Justin Emmerich is a project manager within Water Services. Uh, he's been with our organization and in that division uh, for some time now. Uh, Chad Heiser uh, is one of our fire captains and he also serves as a paramedic. He's a certified paramedic. Uh, Shane Sprazoff is also uh, a firefighter, um, also certified as a paramedic. Uh, Mr. Wesley Forback uh, is one of our fire engineers and a certified paramedic. Um, same with Daniel Schaefer Chavez. He is a fire captain uh, and also a certified paramedic. Uh, and then we have Kevin Wiles, um, who is a fire captain and a paramedic within our Flagstaff Fire Department, and James McCullough, uh, who is also uh, a firefighter paramedic. Thank you, Shannon. We have one individual celebrating her 20 year anniversary, and that's Margaret Roeder uh, with CVB communication specialist. Uh, we so much uh, value her services. Uh, she's helped us out on many levels, uh, including our office upstairs, uh, filling in during vacancies when she's not over at the CVB. So she is multi-talented. She is uh, celebrating her 20 year anniversary. Happy anniversary to you. And Shannon, if you wanna start with the significant 25 year or more, we have a couple of them and I understand we may have one or two who want, are able to spend time with us. Absolutely, so um, our first employee is Ralph Hearn. Um, I've highlighted some things that stood out to me because uh, I wanted to be sure that we shared them with you. Um, Ralph has been in our park section uh, for 26 years. Um, so with that, he brings a great amount of institutional knowledge um, of things related to parks, our foot's trails, um, and our citizens' cemetery. I know often it's kind of strange to think um, of a cemetery fitting within parks, but um, that's where uh, that team exists within our organization. Um, I also thought it was pretty cool uh, of his, uh, I don't know if you would call it excitement, um, but he certainly... Um, is beneficial in the budget process uh, as well as fiscal responsibility. He's currently serving as the supervisor for the Citizen Cemetery, um, and he also oversees the trash and restroom cleaning crew um, that works for the city uh, through the parks section. Um, and then I, I wanted to call out this picture. Um, this is one of Ralph's favorite places in Mexico City. Um, he def definitely likes hikes um, in the desert, um, history and culture, so it wouldn't be surprising that he would like um, this, this location. Um, football, uh, in addition to some of his amazing furry family members. Um, so I hope uh, that gives you a little bit about uh, Ralph Hearn. We are certainly uh, very lucky to have him on our team. Uh, he's also a member of our Employee Advisory Committee, and we appreciate um, his input on behalf of employees through that process. Great. Thank you, Shannon. I would like to talk a bit about uh, Carrie Nelson. Carrie is the Administrative Specialist for Discover Flagstaff, and she is celebrating 27 years of service with Team Flagstaff. In a second, I might ask uh, Heidi Hansen to, to join us and share her comments. And if Carrie's with us, uh, same comment. But I'd like to give a quote from Carrie. I can't believe it's been 27 years here at the city of Flagstaff. I started in the human resources office first 
as the HR clerk and then promoted to the HR administrative assistant for the first five years. When a new position was advertised in another department, I applied and was hired at the Convention and Visitors Bureau as the new administrative specialist. By the way, there's a theme here, and that's uh, that uh, economic vitality uh, has a reputation for poaching good employees throughout the organization, so just wanted to throw that out there. Um, 22 years later in this department, I can honestly say that I have had many great experiences in this position. Tourism and promoting Flagstaff comes easy when you live in a town that you love. Nice quote, Carrie. Uh, Heidi, good to have you. Hi, uh, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members, Heidi Hansen. Um, I just love to talk about Carrie. Carrie has uh, been with us a very long time, and um, I wasn't even working here yet when we were able to get her in the division, so I, uh, Greg can't blame me. But I will say that uh, it's great to have a reputation where people want to come work in your division, so I'm very happy about that. And also, um, I just want to say, Carrie um, has helped out so much with our visitor center. There have been days where we've been short-staffed. Our, our visitor center manager is constantly trying to uh, recruit, which seems to be a theme, right? And Carrie will take it upon herself to go over there and cover shifts and do things like that for us. So she is very astute, not only with the administrative task of our Convention and Visitors Bureau, but also our visitor center. So we value her and her willingness to do all duties as assigned. So Carrie, congratulations. Thanks, Heidi. Thanks for joining us. We, uh, there's a couple of others uh, mentioned. I would invite you to uh, give a look at their uh, anniversaries and their backgrounds of Jeff James uh, uh, with our police department. Shailene uh, Lindley Bigler also uh, with uh, PD and all their wonderful accomplishments. Very impressive um, and celebrating significant anniversaries. I'd like to wrap up by uh, mentioning yet another employee who is celebrating her anniversary, this one, uh, 38 years. Um, Stacy Breckler Nags, uh, who also goes by BK or Stacy BK or SBK or Money Bags or Money Finder, um, started with the city in 1984 and uh, yeah, she's been here for 38 years. Uh, she is an NAU graduate, go Jacks, and she comes from a strong um, government family, uh, civil service family, which has instilled her incredible devotion to community service. Stacy oversees our grants, contracts, and emergency disaster recovery programs in management services uh, in the purchasing, purchasing section. She and her team have processed, organized, and monitored thousands of contracts, having uh, seen the city receive millions of dollars for the city in grant revenue for many very important projects. Also having worked on several emergency events to help our community respond and recover from disasters, she has been very busy over the last few years in that regard. Over the past 10 years, it's notable that the city has realized over $115 million in federal funding alone. Um, much of that at Stacy's oversight and doing. Her accomplishments include law enforcement administration building, the airport runway extension, air rescue firefighting facility, we call that ARF, business incubator and accelerator buildings. I was just at one of those facilities today. The police SWAT and bomb trucks and others. Stacy's professionalism and institutional knowledge of the city of Flagstaff makes her a true asset to the organization. In her free time, which of course is scarce, uh, she enjoys spending time with her family, friends, hiking, reading, and traveling. I'm wondering if we can uh, patch in SBK here for a moment and uh, have her share a little bit of FaceTime with us. Good afternoon, Stacy. Congratulations. Hey. Hi, Mayor and Council. Thank you, that was very nice. Um, and I didn't write all that. So somebody's adding lots of little things there to that. So um, no, I just want to say thank you. Um, I really fell in love with Flagstaff. I um, have been blessed to raise my family here and be involved in many projects for our community. Um, seems like 
I started when I was 12 here, really not <laughs> 38 years. Um, but I really, um, I, I, I have to tell you that the work cannot be done um, without our incredible staff. Um, our past staff, our current staff, I'm very proud of our city staff and all the work we've done together. So, um, so thank you from my heart. Um, really appreciate living here and raising my family and being a part of Team Flagstaff and go Jacks. <laughs> and go Team Flagstaff. So thanks for the, for the time and, and uh, take care. Thank you, Stacy. Congratulations to you. Happy anniversary. Uh, Shannon, thanks for helping me out uh, with a little tag team there. Um, Council, if I may move on to some other things, and then at the end of this report, I might invite uh, those who have monthly reports submitted to offer up some high-level review of those reports. Specifically, we have a monthly update from our capital improvements team. That is for the month of March. Our water services team, that's for the month of January, the sustainability monthly update for the month of February, and information technology also for the month of February. Maybe we'll take them in that same order. Um, capital improvements, water services, sustainability, and IT. Back to some employee recognitions, and again, in no particular order, uh, in the report are some blurbs regarding some recent uh, amazing accomplishments by our fire department crews uh, responding to a number of uh, incidents throughout the community in a very successful fashion, as always. Um, also a, uh, a staff award to Bobby Romero, Josh Crane, Earl Gutierrez, Dan Chavez, Austin Roop, and Kate Williams um, for uh, unit citations for their strong work on a recent code save. Thank you very much to the fire crews. Um, some comment about a, a couple of residential fire responses again, which were successfully handled. On to our police department, um, some updates for you there as well. Uh, and we singled out uh, another officer to mention here, Officer Michael Hansen who was recognized as the Veterans of Foreign Wars FPD, Flagstaff Police Department Officer of the Year by our local VFW chapter on Saturday, February 5th. Uh, he began with our agency in 2013, also an NAU graduate, um, attended the Northern Arizona Regional Training Academy, graduated in May of 2014. Didn't stop there. Mike spent several years gaining experience in patrol. Prior to being promoted to detective, he was assigned to criminal investigations division just a couple of years ago. Took on some complex cases very successfully. And there's a lot of accomplishments and achievements in his background. Uh, he frequently volunteers to come in early or stay late. And his peers and leadership feel that he is the most deserving of this amazing award. So we'd like to congratulate Officer Hansen on uh, that well-deserved uh, recognition by the Veterans of Foreign Wars. Congratulations, sir. Uh, on February 11th, Officer Mike Priest uh, responded to a uh, armed robbery at a local bank. Um, I mention this uh, because these are successful stories without injuries and incidents. In this case, Officer Priest after a very diligent search located and contacted the uh, suspect and uh, who was positively identified and he was placed into custody without incident. Uh, Officer Priest is commended for his diligence in searching for the individual and utilizing his skills to take the suspect into custody without injury. Uh, so congratulations to you, uh, Officer Mike Priest, well done. Council, moving on, we have some updates from the pros division um, of interest there, and uh, a nice update regarding the Thorpe Park Annex project with a couple of Zoom team links um, on events coming up as we go through the community vetting process. Um, continuing on, uh, a lot of updates from, from pros, thank you very much. And then a few uh, tidbits from our Public Works uh, Division, um, all of interest. 
And uh, I'll mention this because I know that uh, is a, of interest to the council, the EV parking at the airport, a little bit delayed due to some national shipping and supply shortages. That seems to be a theme of late. Uh, stay tuned on that. As soon as we have the infrastructure available, the inventory available, we'll let you know. Um, there's been a lot of cross-training in public works, and I'll take note or give note that uh, cross-training with um, our solid waste has proven to be fruitful of late as during the snow event of last week, we were able to have some of our solid waste crews uh, operate the, the plow trucks. Thank you, uh, operators, for that. And uh, that really helped. The cross-training is quite beneficial. On to some uh, matters that I would be seeking some council input of very quickly. We have two letters of support appended to this report. The first is for potential BIL or bill funding. Um, you have a draft letter in front of you going to the Bureau of Reclamation for potential assistance on the Red Gap project. Uh, this has been discussed uh, in recently in a meeting that we had with Sterling Solomon, uh, Lee Story, our outside water council, Nicole Antonopoulos, and Andy Bertelson. Um, we have this draft letter that we would like to send out. A second letter concerns uh, legislation that is in play, um, that is, um, 2031 is the, uh, help me out, Sean, HCR is House Concurrent Resolution. Concurrent resolution. Thank you. Um, 2031, uh, we are weighing in on that one. If approved by the voters, this bill will amend the Arizona Constitution, enabling the state legislature to set employee wages and benefits throughout the state including those offered by private employers. This, of course, would conflict and potentially override other constitutional provisions and voter-approved laws protecting employee pensions, minimum wage, and sick leave benefits. It goes without saying that Flagstaff would be impacted by such legislation. So the statewide preemption would uh, prohibit cities and towns, not counties, not school districts, from regulating wages and benefits. I might stop here and ask for any council input on, on uh, both these letters, uh, and then we'll move on and wrap up here. Thank you. Thank you, City Manager. Um, Council, opening the floor to both of these letters. For any input. Uh, Councilman McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Mayor. On the letter about HCR 2031, I sent in some uh, suggested edits. I believe those have been incorporated. Is that correct? Thank you. Thank you for the edits. My pleasure. Yes, thank you, Councilman McCarthy, for those. Vice Mayor. I don't, excuse me. I don't see the other letter. I'll pull it up here. We're, we're checking. It, it's in the manager's report. What page, if anybody knows? It should be appended to the report, but we're going to double check on that. If I can ask, Vice Mayor, which letter are you referring to? That would be the BIL the, funding. Yeah, the BIL. My apologies. I may have missed that as part of the attachment. Just one moment. As you're looking for that, if we're able to put it up on the screen, that might accomplish the same outcome here. Um, and let me know if I need to resend that. The error might have been on my end, Stacy. Well, in the interim, we can uh, discuss anything with the uh, HER 2031 letter. Um, thank you for getting on the, uh, putting this on for today's agenda. Um, I had requested it regarding the rapid pace in which it is making through got through the House. It is now, as of today, been assigned to um, a Senate committee, and this will drastically affect our voters who approved our, 20, our minimum wage law in 2016 by a 58-42 margin, and I think this is very important to be representing uh, our, our people that we are taking a stand against the, the potential damage that could incur on our uh, Flagstaff voters. 
So obviously I'm in support of <laughs> the opposition letter, and I do want to thank you, Councilmember McCarthy, for for the edits. Yeah, I did offer some edits, but I just want to clarify: I do mm -hmm. support this letter. Yes, thank you. And we will need Ford to uh, move forward with that letter as well. So. Yeah. I might continue on, Mayor and Council, and we may circle back on this one. Uh, it's in transit. Um, Thank you. No problem. Uh, Council Member Shimoni has come in. Thank you, Mayor. I also support that letter and have some <laughs> major concerns about that moving forward. Um, I do wonder if legal advice at some point would be appropriate, uh, maybe sooner than later. And um, yeah, very concerning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this stage, you know, we'll, we'll see how this goes through committee. There's some discussions with, uh, to see if it's actually gonna get through the Senate. Um, uh, Todd Nesgar, a lobbyist, has been contacted about this to discuss on with our state Senate at this point, not just the state house. So um, we'll definitely be monitoring and I, I agree if it comes time that we need some legal advice from our city attorney on this, that we uh, activate accordingly um, uh, upon this moving forward. Hopefully it won't move forward, but <laughs> with that potentiality. Thank you, Mayor. And I think Sterling Solomon has a comment for us. Yes, Sterling. Thank you. And, and, and thank you, Mayor and Council, um, for understanding. Um, I'm actually home, um, recovering for the time being from a, a recent incident. So I appreciate your understanding and not being physically present. Uh, I'm very grateful to be able to remote in. Um, if there are any real difficult questions, I, I do believe Greg was right. Ms. Devlin would be able to handle those from a legal perspective, too. I'm, I'm just kidding, Ms. Devlin. <laughs> I, I do want to uh, um, let you know that right now there is no legal advice to be given with respect to 2031. We haven't done any research on that. We're waiting to see, just like you have already discussed, what's going to happen um, if the, the bill moves further. Um, we'll, we'll take it up from there if there appears to be a need for us to do some research on that and advise council accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Sterling. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, on your screen uh, is a copy of the draft letter to the Bureau of Reclamation Phoenix office. This concerns a notice of interest in participation of the bipartisan legislation for for rural water development addressed to Mr. Black. Um, and this is uh, specifically requesting technical assistance from the Bureau of Rec to develop water supplies for Flagstaff uh, with particular interest in the city's Red Gap Ranch project being considered for funding under uh, the bill legislation. Um, and I won't read it uh, word for word, but it would invite you to do uh, that. Um, the outcome of a uh, recent appraisal uh, level water supply study in 2006 and more recently with the interim feasibility study in 2016 has targeted water supply alternatives tied to water from the Colorado River with the water rights adjudication still unsettled for the little Colorado watershed uh, as well as the extended drought stressing the Colorado River water supply. Um, the city, of course, continues to pursue additional alternative, alternatives to address Flagstaff's future water needs, including uh, the feasibility uh, study of a pipeline uh, that would take water from the sea aquifer groundwater to the city of Flagstaff from the city's Red Gap Ranch uh, as purchased in 2005. Um, and that feasibility of that pipeline uh, uh, has been pursued um, since uh, 2005. Up until this time, the city has invested upwards of between 11 and $15 million in securing and realizing this supply through engineering studies, land acquisition, well drilling, and securing necessary agreements. Council, you've had some good updates uh, on this of late. Uh, so with that, um, 
I think, again, I'm not going to read uh, every, every word of this, but I would open it up for any questions. I think at this point you probably have a good uh, understanding of the basis of the request letter. Thank you, City Manager. Uh, Council, any uh, comments, questions regarding this? Vice Mayor? Do we need to get this letter in this week? Um, the question is whether it needs to go in this week. Uh, Sterling Solomon, if you're nearby, do you have a sense of the timing of this or anybody from Water Services? Aaron Young, if you're with us, maybe you can field that one. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Aaron Young in Water Services. There is no immediate deadline. Can we have a week to take a look at this and read it? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I support that as, as, well, as well. Okay. I see a lot of non-heads, so that'd be great. Thank you, Mayor Council. Stacy. Thank you. I just wanted to know, I did send that letter to mayor and council, so you have that now in your email to review. Thank you much. All right. Well, with that, we do have three that have um, confirmed support for the HCR 2031 letter and uh, would need a fourth to move forward with that. Vice Mayor. I support it. Okay. So there we have our four. Um, thank you very much, city manager. And, thank you uh, for the report. Yep, thank you, Mayor and Council. We'll circle back on this other letter next week. I want to ask for your input on one more thing and then ask the uh, various division directors to give you a high-level overview of their monthly reports. The uh, last item I want to touch on is the Sunshine Transport Solutions Corp, STSC. Uh, you have appended to my report uh, an executive summary from STSC that will give you I think adequate background on this topic and this idea. Uh, the group presented to Metro Plan a while back. I was in attendance. Uh, I was in attendance at that meeting, as was others. Um, and the request now uh, coming from STSC is that uh, they would like your audience and they would like the ability to present this idea to you at a future work session. Um, this is a little bit out of protocol in terms of this not being a fair item, uh, not being anything that's necessarily being advanced to you by the, the staff here, but rather we are just being, I guess, a mouthpiece uh, as the, there's interest in this corporation to have some uh, time with council to talk about this idea. I wanted to solicit your input on that, if I may. Thank you, City Manager. Councilmember McCarthy, yeah. <laughs> um, I guess a question to the other council members. Are you familiar with this? Do you know what we're talking about? If not, I could give a little overview on it. Uh, on the other hand, if council is aware of what it is, then I won't take that time. I'm aware of it, but it would also be good for the public to understand what we're discussing at the, the meeting. So, um, and I know you're more familiar than others on this uh, subject, so. All right, thank you, Mayor. And of course, the reason that I'm more familiar with it is because they came to the uh, Metro Plan and I'm the chair of the Metro Plan right now. So, and I've sat in uh, two short meetings with uh, Sunshine Transit. So the basic idea is that they would build, um, it's like a tramway, but there's, they're not hanging from cables. They're actually like on tracks that are up above like the sidewalk. And there's little pods, maybe we call them, similar to what you would see up at the ski resort. Um, small, probably could hold one to four people, maybe one to six people. And what you would do is call up on your uh, cell phone and say, hey, I need a car at such and such a location to take me to wherever. You know, maybe it's like I'm at NAU and I want to go to the mall or whatever. So, but to do this, we would have to grant right away to build these pods and the infrastructure that goes with them. 
They're fairly narrow. They would go over the sidewalks. Um, they would have stations where you would get on and off, and those would be also fairly small, about the width of a one parking lane. So there's a lot of issues that we brought up to this corporation about how are you going to fund it if it goes defunct, you know, how are you going to uh, take it down? There had to be some kind of bond for that. Um, you know, there's right of way issues with the city, with ADOT, um, the cost of it. And uh, yeah. Regina, I think you have some comments. Go, why don't you add in, please? Yeah. Oh, and then issues with BNSF, the railroad. So I think the real basic issue is do we want to have these things over our sidewalks around town? Um, and so far, I haven't taken a position on it. I will when I have to. Um, I've been basically just, you know, facilitating discussions between this corporation and the city and the uh, FMPO. So does that kind of give people an idea of what we're talking about? Mm -hmm. You know, Rick Barrett, if you have any added thoughts, uh, this might be a good time. At That's the pleasure of thinking. the mayor. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, if, well, let's uh, have it with other council members if there's any questions regarding this or uh, anything else. Um, but I would like input because this seems very expensive and a very massive infrastructure project um, that... Uh, would warrant a lot of thinking through and a lot more than just a one-page um, pamphlet to be able to uh, to get to that point. So uh, I don't know if, Mr. Baird, you'd like to comment or um, hold off until after our uh, <laughs> council kind of weighs in. Good evening, Honorable Mayor, Vice Mayor, Member of Council. I am Rick Barrett, City Engineer. I really don't have any comments at this point in time. It's an unfunded project. It's not on anybody's work program. We're busy. Uh, that being said, I'm looking to council's direction. Thank you. Uh, with that, open it up to council on um, the potentiality of this. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I checked this out a little bit before the meeting, and it's not something that I'm interested in having a conversation about. Thank you. Um, Councilmember Sweet. Uh, given how busy we are and everything on our plates at the moment, I am also not interested in having the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Shimoni and then council members tell us. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I too don't think that this rises to the level of being on a council agenda, um, but welcome them to communicate with us um, and engage with us. But yeah, I don't think it's time to put them on a, a future agenda. Thank you. Okay, council members tell us. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, wearing my Metroplan board hat Metro Plan Board has not supported moving forward with this project simply because we are in the process of a regional transportation planning called Stride Forward with all of our multiple partners, uh, uh, ADOT, uh, NAU, Mountain Line, NAPTA, which is our public transit authority. So if this company is trying to solve a public transit uh, problem, it has to be vetted fully from uh, our NAPTA Public Transit Authority. Uh, second, um, uh, the, the stride, stride Forward Regional Transport, Transportation Planning process is, is, uh, is rolling out. Uh, perhaps this can be discussed at that level. Um, and again, I'm very mindful of our limited staff time available. So this is not on my priority either as a council member and as a Metro Plan board member. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Salas. Uh, I'll just add in that um, I think it's kind of jumping over a few phases to get before council. 
And so presenting this with Metro Plan, meeting with NAPTA, Transportation Commission would be the best first start rather than jumping straight to council. Um, so that's what I would suggest to this private company and just the, the method of um, more incremental approach. So. Thank you, Mayor and Council, for uh, your thoughtful input. And again, I apologize for uh, taking things a little bit out of order uh, on, on that, but uh, sometimes that's the nature of it. Uh, I will conclude by asking members of uh, in order uh, capital improvements uh, to speak. Uh, I, that might be Rick Barrett uh, on the March update, which is in your packet uh, with a nice map, which by the way is on the backside of the monthly report. Rick will be followed by uh, uh, somebody from Water Services uh, on that monthly update. For January, and then we will segue into sustainability, and then information technology, and then we will conclude. And thank you for giving us so much time. Thank you, City Manager Clifton, and again, good evening, honor Honorable Mayor and Vice Mayor and members of Council. I am Rick Barrett, City Engineer and Engineering Director. Um, so quick, high level here. There's a lot. I think it was 36 pages. Um, February is one of our slow months. Uh, but one of the things I just want to point out is that this report is technically for the month of February. You know, here we are on March 1st, but we're reporting in arrears for the month that just occurred. We do report on all phases of projects. Reminder is that that can be in the planning phase, it can be in the design phase, or it can be construction. Planning and design is not winter dependent or weather dependent, obviously, but those projects that are in construction tend to be slower. Uh, just due to the snowfall and the wet moisture. Um, we try to keep this thing succinct. Uh, we try to do just that report out on a February only. Um, again, there's a lot going on. The map kind of shows everything that City Manager Clifton pointed out. Uh, if you ever have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to reach out to us. We're available. Um, if there's something you want more information on, please reach out. Um, so quickly, some highlights is uh, the active transportation master plan. Uh, we have completed our uh, common period. We received uh, responses, 250 surveys. Uh, we're in the process of compiling that information. Our next step is to bring a minor amendment forward to city council for your consideration of that plan. Uh, we also have Woody Way as well as the university traffic calming in there. Again, progress has been slow, but we are working with Public Works as soon as weather breaks that we can get some striping out there. Uh, we have replaced the, uh, the traffic circle, the temporary traffic circle. It's made out of orange barriers now at the, uh, it's on University. I forget exactly the intersection. It might be Tombaugh. Yeah, thank you, uh, Council Member McCarthy. Um, so yeah, we've actually swapped that out. It's a small mini circle. It's uh, you know kind of being um, demonstrated, if you will, temporarily just to see if it works. Uh, so we're pretty pretty proud of that effort right now. A uh, lot of work continues to um, support uh, public works as well as water services in regard to the spruce wash improvements. Um, specifically, we've got designs completed for the spruce wash between Cedar and Dortha, which does include a box culvert beneath Dortha itself. Uh, so those plans are actually being routed for signature right now. Uh, we've been working with the utility companies, that being the gas company and the electric company. We continue to uh, knock on doors, talk to property owners, making sure we have the adequate property rights to move forward. Uh, we should be very, uh, very clearly on schedule to be complete with that segment of the improvements before uh, the monsoon seasons kick in. Uh, keep moving. Uh, park basins. Uh, this is a project being delivered by the county flood control district, but uh, being in the city of Flagstaff, uh, we're working to acquire the necessary property rights. Again, that's involving talking to property owners. Uh, and then uh, finalizing the design through those discussions and you know, making sure they're happy with what's on the design and then making sure we got the property rights for it. Uh, if you've been in La Plaza Vieja, we have been 
slowly working through these through this winter weather. We've got uh, the Clay and Kingman intersections under construction. Uh, that's going to be a good project to help slow traffic down in that neighborhood. Much needed improvement. Uh, we've got our Beulah University project. We've completed 90% plans. We've been working with ADOT. We've got comments on that. We've got our uh, uh, risk on board. We've been getting cost estimates. Uh, so we're coming very close to being able to uh, get this thing wrapped up in terms of paper and then get uh, the contractor out under construction. We anticipate that'll be a two season construction, uh, basically two phases. We wanna get Beulah extended north all the way up to Yale. Uh, and then build that university roundabout on Beulah and have that functional before we start ripping into Milton to build that, uh, to that ped crossing, uh, which obviously is gonna impact traffic on Milton. So having that uh, parallel detour route before we rip into Milton is our plan at this point in time. You can read about the downtown mile, which is inclusive of the Rio de Flag and it's a pedestrian tunnel right under the railroad tracks out here south of City Hall. We also have our uh, Florence Walnut pedestrian crossing that's tied into all this. Also included is the Lone Tree Overpass, which council's well aware of. Uh, we continue to coordinate with the uh, Mountain Lines Downtown Connections Center. And then all that focuses around the Milton Bridge reconstruction. Uh, that's pretty much the crux of the whole dilemma that we're trying to solve here. Uh, we've got several aging infrastructure projects. Um, the Route 66 El Paso water line, which is a, uh, replacing an aging water line. Uh, that work will start in the spring, but council's already awarded the project. And our Huntington project is primarily done, except the paving has been postponed just until we get better, warmer temperatures. Uh, probably the biggest thing and the thing we're most proud of is the completion of the Phoenix Bridge and water line replacement project. Uh, we were able. Can everyone turn their cell phones off, please? Potential spam. <laughs> Potential spam. I'm sorry. <laughs> So uh, the Phoenix Bridge was completed. We've opened Phoenix. I know it's to Mountain Lines delight that uh, they have uh, access for their buses again. Uh, but that project was a good one to get completed. Uh, fortunately, we didn't get flooded out. Worked out really well. We had a great contractor out there. Two last items. We got the library entrances ready to bid. We're working with our job order contractors to get a quote on that and hopefully get that in front of council in the near future. And then we continue to work hard on the fourth cedar locket roundabout. Um, just working with ADOT, so you'll be seeing an IGA coming forward um, as we try to figure out how uh, construction services will, will occur during that work. Uh, there's a cost escalation that's occurred, so we've got a funding gap. And then we also have property acquisition that uh, the city's going to take on. That's just in the capital improvements group, and I'm glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Rick. Any uh, questions at this time, Council? Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Rick Barrett. Uh, can we uh, have somebody from Water Services? Mayor, I'm so sorry. Yeah, please. Yeah, Councilman Schwenny. Rick, come on back. <laughs> <I'm away. laughs> Sorry about that. Um, thank you so much for the update. I, I am so grateful for this update and all that work. Oh my gosh, that is a ton you all are taking on. And every time we get a report, I, my, my respect for the work that your team does just increases. So thank you. Um, I have a few questions. I'm going to go rapid fire just to be time effective with everybody if that's okay, Mayor. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, with the bike pilot, I, I do wonder, Mayor and Rick, you know, there's a lot of talk about phase one leading into phase two. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if we can start start planning and talking about phase two. I know that we're waiting on data and we, we're gonna be coming back with information, but uh, I just wanna make sure we're planning for phase two and it's not gonna take three, three years to reach phase two. Um, so that's one idea. Um, 
Rick, I don't know if you want to comment to that, but I guess it's more of a comment for the group. Uh, Thank you, Council Member. We, we, uh, I just want to note that we, we are going to have a um, capital improvement project um, retreat here in um, the end of March. So well, please uh, ask or provide comments and ask the questions, but maybe it would be better for uh, Mr. Barrett to take the notes and be able to address that at our retreat as well. And that was an idea I had too, was that we could, we could talk about this deeper at the retreat. So Rick, maybe that's what we do. Um, Okay, so I'm gonna move on to my other comments and questions. Um, so with both roundabouts, my understanding is that the cost is significant in the increase. And I'm wondering if that could be a discussion that council has is to review that cost and potential options moving forward. Like Rick Wright, isn't the Beulah roundabout like 9 million over budget? Yeah. Unfortunately, that is uh, accurate information, council member. Right. And I just heard you say that Lockett and Forth is also going to be over budget. So it'd be great, you know, Mayor Rick and, and City Manager, if, if Council could, could talk about that. Is that possible? Well, first, I would add that, um, not, you know, none of these projects are going to move forward to construction without Council approval. Um, they each kind of have different processes. Uh, the Forest Cedar Roundabout is a highway safety improvement program project, uh, which is primarily administered by the Arizona Department of Transportation within our city. Uh, we're responsible to pay for it, which is why I mentioned that an IGA, an intergovernmental agreement, is going to be coming forward to help get updated on all these costs. Um, so that's going to be coming to council in the next month or so. And then council, of course, would have an opportunity to prove the guaranteed maximum price that's associated with our construction manager at risk that I just mentioned uh, before we move forward with uh, construction of the Beulah University project. And again, uh, March 31st, as we walk through the programming of these projects, you'll see how we have um, done the best job we can to identify the necessary funding. Uh, we've plugged that into the program that, again, we'll talk about here in a month. Uh, and uh, th that's probably the most appropriate time to further that discussion. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I know that we're 90% with design with Beulah. And, you know, I just wonder at what point do we look at smaller designs for these projects that will cost less. But uh, thank you, Rick. And then my, my other question is, uh, are we expanding the QR banner communication approach that we did with Navajo? Is that something that's building in terms of our communica uh, strategy for communication? Uh, absolutely, it can be, it, um, it is. Um, we are unable to do it on all projects. It kind of depends on the funding source, but that could also be something to discuss further as we just look at the overall costs associated with all these projects and the staff time associated therewith, uh, being able to um, advance that. So, I mean, our really, our, our A game, our A plus game involves hiring consultants to help us. Um, we don't do that on all projects, but uh, council's guidance to that point would be most appreciated. Very good, thank you for that. And then in regards to the Rio de Flag and the Milton Bridge reconstruction, uh, really glad to read those updates. Uh, really quick, in regards to phase two of the concept engineering study that was completed and presented to ADOT and BNSF, can you speak to their responses? I'm sorry, council member, what was the project? Uh, with the Milton Bridge reconstruction, um, there was, a, there was like, uh, an update given that a concept was uh, presented to ADOT and BNSF on February 18th. ADOT did not have yeah. so many comments. Um, we're working through comments from BNSF Railway right now. Um, most of the comments have to do with the construction sequencing associated with this complicated project. Uh, BNSF is requiring that we uh, maintain 100 trains a day throughout every minute of the construction. Uh, we've been aware of this condition. We continue to work on it. Uh, so that continues to be, again, as we're 
you know, as we're perfecting these plans, a lot of it's focusing on how we're going to sequence the construction. Um, ADOT is then concerned about um, the height of the new bridge. So right now that bridge out here today I'm pointing to is uh, 13 foot 10 inches off the surface of the roadway. And the new requirements are 16 and a half feet. So we're working to obtain that additional, whatever that is, three feet-ish. But that's the nature okay. of the comments. I mean, it's not, I, we're not hearing fatal flaw. We're hearing, again, more about uh, construction logistics associated with implementation. Totally. Okay, thank you so much, Rick. And thank you, Mayor and Council. Thank you, Council Member Shimoni. All right. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. And uh, yeah, moving along with the next division. Thank you, Mayor Council. Do we have an uh, update from? Good, good afternoon, Mr. Bertels. Good afternoon, Greg. It's good to see you, uh, Mayor and Council. I would love to give the update, but I want to give the mic to Lisa Deem. Uh, Lisa. Uh, works hard to put together our communication efforts here in water services, as well as our budgeting efforts, um, which has been no small task as of late. Uh, we're actually meeting with the budget team tomorrow morning and we're excited about that. So just want to take a few moments to say uh, hello, good evening. And if Lisa is with us, I will turn the mic to her. If she was not, I will provide the update, but thank you. I am here and ready. Good afternoon, Council, Mayor and Council. Our update for you is January's. We are we're running a little behind, not terribly, on providing their updates. And I'm just going to give you some high level, some some highlights of what we of what happened in January. And it was mostly time for we we're working with the Citizen Bond Committee uh, to present. Uh, to present projects for both stormwater and wastewater. Wastewater presented their projects on January 20th and the 27th, and uh, stormwater actually presented theirs on February 3rd. So we're looking for, for some of the bond money to help support some of our infrastructure needs, as I'm sure you've been hearing about all of these infrastructure needs. We're also moving forward on an upcoming rate study. We want to make sure we're, we're, we're a little behind the ball on, on the rate study, but uh, that will come in tandem with all, any other efforts for grants and other outside funding, federal funding that we can find that's available to be able to use to maximize the work that we can we can get done on our infrastructure. Um, sad to say, Mark Richardson has retired as our operations section director. He was with us for 12 years, just shy of 12 years. He leaves a big hole. He's also our security, our security officer. Um, we have a big shift in our water commission. We have five new members. Two are returning, uh, and they're very, very uh, motivated, and we're really happy to have them and get them to, to uh, do some work to move some of our objectives forward. Uh, in communications and administration, we have a public health intern uh, from NAU, Megan White, and she is, you will be hearing more about this Poo in the Park campaign uh, that is going into the local schools are involved in it to kind of increase awareness and outreach on how we can clean up our stormwater and our, our uh, water in general initiatives. This will be in both a poster contest and actually mapping the poo in the parks and then seeing and having surveys uh, with the public at the parks to kind of uh, change attitudes. This isn't a enforcement. This is a improve your attitude kind of uh, campaign. Uh, SCADA. 
So SCADA and information systems, they're kind of the behind the scenes. They're the heart and soul, really, of water. They monitor all of everything that moves in water, SCADA is monitoring. And they're now going out of the distribution and collection systems, and they're moving into our facilities. So they're doing a de they just did a demo at the Rio de Flag Water Reclamation. They're adding pumps, motors, and VFDs. What this does is this gives a regular system to inspect and manage all of our equipment, and that means less breakdowns. It's, it's a huge, huge step forward for us in the maintenance. Most of the stuff that they talk about, I don't even understand that terminology, but I know that it works. We're also working with the DHS to monitor our systems. We're separating our IT to our OT. So the OT is, is what makes our SCADA systems work. And what this is doing is this is to keep hackers from being able to come in and have any uh, cybersecurity issues uh, from messing with our water systems. So we're, we're, they're starting on that process. We're changing how we manage our facility security with Mark Richardson gone, the door locks and access. So we're changing that process to make it uh, easier for everyone to use. Uh, you've probably heard a lot about stormwater. That's in our reports as well because that is our division. But uh, you know the Kellip Retention Basin, they're hitting rock the said basins that the uh, county is doing. You've heard about all of this. We're monitoring it and it's taking, it's a large part of what we do on a daily basis. We do have some federal infrastructure money that should be coming in. And while we're very happy to have it, we're kind of holding our breath till we see when it comes. And um, Mr. Barrett already spoke to you about the legal public utility easements on Parkway to make sure that we have the rights to do our to, to do the work. You know, many of our crews every day they make a difference. And when you're down a few people, we have two we're we're short on two people. It makes it it we can feel that. So our people have to work even harder. Uh, water distribution, you know, they don't just take care of your distribution pipes, they take care of your fire hydrant maintenance, and they do all the inspections on the capital pro projects. So they work in, in a number of different areas, including on the, um, on the uh, blue stake. That's part of their area of design, of, of work. Water production. So with Lake Mary, with our dry winter, Lake Mary is at a low stage. So we're doing, they're embarking in a valve replacement project. There's six really very large valves that are being replaced. And the only way that can be done is to have the service production completely shut down. So with these low levels at Lake Mary and we're not producing water because of that, this is a good time to be doing that kind of work and that kind of repairs. Again, doing the maintenance is huge for making sure that we don't have any interruptions in service and water quality remains at the high level that our standards hold it to. Um, the backwash tower at Lake Mary is going to get repainted. We're sent, sent it out to procurement as well as the sludge drying beds ahead of new concrete sides. So, there, so we're doing little improvements as we can to, to get ready for our seasons. One of the big projects that is a large part of our water capital budget are the sedimentation basin rehab projects. And so we're, we're sending that back out. The bid came in higher than expected, as has been the case for, for many construction projects. And um, we're going to we're going to try again to see what we can do to get it done, maybe in, in stages. The Forest Service is doing a thinning project um, uh, that will in, impact our raw water pipe, pipeline, so there will be mitigations to protect that water pipeline. We've already had the survey done on that. Moving to the water reclamation plants, uh, the bond is a big is one of our big pushes, as well as we're looking at applying for some grant money, never guaranteed, and it's never on the budget until we actually get it, but hopefully maybe for some backup generators um, through uh, a COVID grant. 
let's see, wildcat projects. There's a lot of small projects. Well, they're not small in money, but there's a lot of projects just for maintenance, just for upkeep. These are older facilities and they do need to have they do need to have repair and replacements. And when they are replaced, we're doing it. We're upgrading to the best technology that we can. Water Resources uh, submitted their five-year drought management plan to the ADWR, the Department of Water Resources. Uh, we are, uh, we do have a hundred year water designation, which is pretty good for the state of Arizona. We're also working on a reclaim water retreat for council. Uh, then stay tuned for that. There'll be more on that. We were able, Water Resources did hire a new technician. Mallory Burkowski is a AZ Hydrological Society intern scholar, and she's going to be working on monitoring the equipment in the uh, Lake Mary watershed uh, with the Lake Mary Walnut Canyon TAC. And that's just monitoring the flows that are coming into Lake Mary. Conservation is getting ready for Water Awareness Month, which will be in April. Uh, they just finished installing, helping install new fixtures at Flag Junior Academy over the winter break with an estimated 25% reduction in water consumption. They put in efficient toilets, aerators. They've moved on to uh, businesses, hotels to help get the whole community involved in water conservation. And I think I will stop there and see if we have any questions. Council, do we have any questions at this time? All right, I'm not seeing any right now. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for the update. Um, excellent information. I think if we can continue on and we'll keep this very high level, uh, the next one up is sustainability. Thank you. Great. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Nicole Antonopoulos, Sustainability Director. It's nice to be here with you. Um, just to provide some high-level updates on the work that sustainability has been completing in the past month of February, I'm thrilled to announce that Summer White recently joined our team as our Waste Reduction and Food Systems Coordinator. Summer is an NAU graduate, and before joining our team, she was a full-time AmeriCorps VISTA with our program. Um, I really like to highlight our collaboration with the AmeriCorps VISTA program through NAU, um, and I'll highlight a few exciting announcements here in just a moment. But in her new role, Summer will focus on reducing waste and managing uh, that we have brought management of our community gardens in-house. So she will be managing our community gardens program and the urban farm incubator, as well as backyard animal keeping outreach. Uh, something that I want to share with the council is we will be hosting our signature nine week sustainability leaders training. The program educates and equips participants to be advocates for sustainability in the five staff community. Our um, applications open today and um, they will be accepted through March 15th. The training will take place over nine weeks every Wednesday from April 6th to June 1st from 5.30 to 8.30 p.m. And we will be hosting those at the sustainability office. We've cleaned up um, our garage a fair amount and we used this for our last training session and it worked quite well. We want to be really respectful of our participants' comfort um, being in person. Uh, class capacity will be limited to 20 participants and um, we hope that you will help us spread the word. In our climate action, um, you will be hearing uh, more about this the, later this evening, but as you know, the Residential Sustainable Building Incentive update uh, was pre presented to council last month and then now is returning this evening for a second read and potential adoption. Uh, we've been working very closely with the Citizen Bond Committee and actually presented last week and return again this Thursday for further discussion on the proposed climate action um, bond projects. 
in community stewards, our litter prevention programming, we have uh, launched a new grant opportunity that we are calling the Engage, Empower, and Elevate grant. And this grant really has um, twofold uh, purpose. One is to help address the record high number of unsheltered community members in Flagstaff, as well as keeping Flagstaff litter free, in an on uh, which is an ongoing challenge. The grant will award an organization up to $30,000 for a project that provides employment opportunities to persons experiencing homelessness at minimum wage. Um, and we um, will be asking them to help us abate litter in our community. Again, uh, we will be circulating some information, but if you know of any organizations that may be interested in applying for the grant, applications are open through March 11th. I'm pleased to say that Sustainability and the Friends of the Rio jointly apply to NAU's Center for Service and Volunteerism, which is the AmeriCorps programming. Uh, we applied for a Rio Stewardship Coordinator position, and we just found out that we were granted the award. So we will be hosting that shared position in our office, and they will be working, the position will be working to engage and educate community members and students on the importance of the city's watershed, as well as um, encouragement for the care of the, our environmental issues. In the month of February, our litter cleanups actually started really ramping up. We had over 200, um, well, almost 290 hours of volunteer time that was donated by 130 to dedicated members of our community. Uh, I would also like to let the council and community know that we have just scheduled a winter snowflake cleanup for Thursday, this Thursday at 1 p.m. And we're going to be targeting our efforts at the snowplay area at the intersection of J.W. Powell and Lone Tree. So there will be information being circulated um, via email to City of Flagstaff employees and of course a lot of public uh, information out there. In our energy program, we hosted another home energy efficiency workshop. Uh, we had four attendees on uh, February 24th. Regarding our food systems programming, our community garden registration has opened for the upcoming growing season. So we have actually switched um, the process. As I mentioned, we're taking all the garden management in-house and our online application will be open to the public March first. Um, and we will have um, applications available in both English and Spanish. In materials management, uh, our current residential food scrap drop-off station that you have heard about, which is currently hosted at the Flagstaff CSA store, has become so popular that we have had to increase pickup from twice a month to weekly. Um, since the launch of our efforts of this program in October, we've diverted over 4,000 pounds of food, uh, food waste from the landfill. And just a couple more uh, upcoming sustainability events. Uh, we will be hosting another Fix-It Clinic on Saturday, March 26th from 10 till 2. And then we that will be at the Joe C. Montoya Community and Senior Center. And then we have yet another home energy efficiency workshop, which will be held on March 8th um, from 6 to 8 p. Uh, excuse me, 6 to 7 p.m. And um, we are determining the location pending discussion from council regarding COVID. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Nicole. Um, any questions, Council? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Council Member Schimone does have a question. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Vice Mayor, and Nicole, hi. Thank you for the presentation, the update. Congratulations on 15 years. Thank you. And to Jenny for five, that's really exciting. Um, a uh, quick question. I, I'm so excited about this Engage, Empower, and Elevate grant for $30,000. Um, and I'm just wondering, has the team thought about potentially presenting this at a upcoming COC meeting, uh, Continuum of Care Group, that Heather Marcy? Yeah. Yeah, you bet. We've been um, we've been in dialogue with them a fair amount since um, framing, the, uh, developing the framework for this program. Oh, great. Very good. That's wonderful. Yeah, they have a great group and uh, presenting, I think, would go a long way, too. Um, and then secondly, I, I, I know that Albuquerque set something like this up through the through the, a different effort, but similar. 
And uh, I think they were able to pay the uh, individuals with cash. Do you know if that's at all possible within this grant? So one of the reasons we are actually create we have created a grant opportunity is to um, in one of the things that we heard in talking with community groups and developing the framework for the program was the need for um, to be able to be nimble. Um, and you are exactly right. You you touched down on um, a really critical point. It will um, by using a grant method um, for distributing these resources. It will allow the applicants to develop a program that they best believe uh, works for our community and our community members. These are a lot of things that we would not be able to do at the city. Uh, so yes, you've hit the nail on, on the proverbial head. Our hope is that there are applications that come in that really um, in, um, uh, incorporate the needs of our, of our unsheltered community members. Very good. That's all I had. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm not seeing any more. So I just moved the screen. Uh, C's and Q's and chat box or um, nods from council. So thank you again, sustainability team. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Mayor and Council. And then uh, briefly, if we can have somebody from IT speak to the monthly report, and then we will conclude. Thank you. Hello, Mayor and Council. Uh, CJ Perry, IT director. Uh, I'm just going to do some brief highlights from our uh, monthly report. Um, the first one is, is that our mission statement is our purpose is to provide you the secure tools to make your job easier tomorrow than it was today. So we hope that everything you see in this report um, is done with uh, that framework in mind. Um, as part of that, some of the things we, we do um, for our staff is provide tips. And so we've got a tip of the month on um, helping staff avoid the back-to-back -back meetings, um, especially with a lot of the remote work. A lot of people have back-to-back -back meetings with no breaks in between. So we offer some tips on how you can automatically schedule some of those meetings to incorporate a break uh, into that to allow people to you know, grab drinks and use restrooms and things like that between meetings because uh, we've noticed staff have, have had those back-to-back -back meetings since uh, we've, we've been in a remote environment. Uh, we also have a staff spotlight, um, Bill Reagan, uh, the way we do the spa uh, staff spotlight is every month we at our staff meeting we ask who embodied our mission statement the most this last month and and bill was the one that we're highlighting this week um, he was able to jump on a on a network issue he's our network administrator uh, administrator so he handles all of the connectivity for all of our devices and, and computers and servers and all of that stuff and so there's a little bit of information about him there um, as far as some major project updates, we're really excited about a lot of the momentum in, uh, with fiber. We've, as you know, we've got some uh, letters of support for some grants, uh, some $10 million ACA grants. We're waiting to hear back on those. There's already been an extension uh, as far as when we're going to hear back. So as soon as we know something, I'll pass it along to uh, council. Um, but another big announcement is that the governor's office announced additional funding to fund fiber from Flagstaff to the California border. Um, along I-40. So um, huge amount of momentum there. We're really excited for that, along with a, a lot of the other projects that are um, already in the works. Um, the other big project uh, from the IT perspective is we're integrating IT support for our police department. Um, that We've appreciated the partnership with the Coconino County Sheriff's Office, um, but as, as we've been integrating a lot more technology, it, it makes a lot of sense to integrate the police department with um, our own uh, IT support. Uh, we've already migrated all of their email uh, and we're slowly working towards um, taking over full support of all of their laptops um, and that uh, project is going along really well and we're really excited about that. Um, there's plenty more in the report and I'll, I'll um, let you each uh, read that at, at your pleasure but uh, the one thing I wanted to highlight it from a program accomplishments perspective is the help desk. We have had 10 months of 100% awesome customer uh, satisfaction ratings across the board. 10 months straight, so I just really wanted to give a shout out to our help desk. Um, they do a lot. Uh, they work really hard to, to respond quickly and, and solve um, our customers' problems, which is our, our staff. So really wanted to just kind of highlight them, and, and we're so proud of them. So the rest I'll let you read at your pleasure. Thank you, Council. Thank you, CJ. Uh, any questions from Council? Super excited about the new fiber project, by the way, as you might expect. This is really great news from the state and uh, helping our community. All right, uh, with that, city manager. 
Thank you, Mayor, Council. That concludes. Again, thank you for giving us such uh, attention to this. It's been a little bit long, but uh, we'll get caught up on these reports. So thanks for your time and your thoughtful comments. Oh, thank you. Um, on to agenda item number seven, which is our COVID-19 updates. Good afternoon, City Council. Uh, just pulling up our slideshow now. Sorry, a little bit of a delay there. No problem. So today we have for you an update uh, on the data, both from Coconino County Health and Human Services, as well as Northern Arizona Healthcare, our Navajo Nation, and our Hopi Tribe. Um, Rose will also provide us an Indigenous Nations update as well. Uh, we'll finish today's presentation uh, speaking about the CDC updates that occurred this last Friday, February 25th, um, and a discussion on masks in our city facilities. Um, looking at our COVID-19 weekly cases, uh, we have seen another week of downward trend. Uh, we've seen 267 cases. Uh, week ending February 19th. Um, the week of February 12th did go up slightly. This was originally 516 cases, now 524. Um, looking at our cases by a geographic area, um, you'll see the drastic decrease in the number of Flagstaff cases. This is our fifth week of a downward trend. Looking at our hospital um, admissions also seeing a good trend on this. Um, instead of the up and down, we've seen two weeks um, that have reduced slightly each week, uh, most recently February 19th with 17 cases. Uh, the week prior, February 12th, did increase slightly from 16 to 19, but still less than what we were seeing at the beginning of the month. Um, our number of hospitalizations is still impacting our age groups, most significantly that are 65 and older. For our COVID-19 related deaths, um, good news is uh, this is hopefully trending downwards as well. We have one death reported uh, for February, the week of February 19th, and there have been no updates to the previous weeks. So looking at our community transmission level, um, this is the uh, tracking that has been updated by the CDC, but I felt it was important to share with you um, what was included in the February 19th report. Um, we continue to see our rate per 100,000 residents decrease. In this report, it was 188.7 compared to 364.7 the week prior. Also saw a decrease in our positivity rate, um, which is 10.6, as you see here, compared to 14% the week prior. And our COVID-like illness also dropped to 7.4 from 8.9. Uh, looking at our vaccinations, um, this chart uh, is in the process of changing on the Coconino County Health and Human Services site. So I did pull this data. Uh, out of the weekly report, it shows you um, where we are with the number of doses administered, um, looking at, you know, the series of so someone's first dose and second dose, um, and then if they received a booster after that. Um, I can report that the number of fully vaccinated uh, individuals in the Flagstaff area um, has increased from 55,219 to 55,326. So we are continuing to see an increase in the numbers of individuals fully vaccinated. For our COVID variants, I'm happy to report, this is our first weekly report in quite some time that there have not been any new Delta cases. Um, these are again, samples that are tested um, by uh, some of our local uh, sorry, epidemiologist, <laughs> the word escaped me there for a moment, um, but we have seen a slight increase in Omicron, um, an additional 85 samples, uh, taking us to the 1,610 from the 1,525 previously. 
Uh, when we look at our hospital census, um, this is looking uh, good. Our number of positive cases dropped by 14 uh, to 26 individuals. We were at 40 previously. Um, our number of pending uh, did increase slightly from one to three, as you see on the screen before you. Um, our number of hospital beds has gone down slightly uh, from 58 beds the week prior to 54 beds uh, during this point in time, which this was pulled on February 28th. Um, just as a reminder, these numbers are updated on a daily basis. Um, and then the last number of critical care beds, um, this has increased from six beds to 12. Um, so very good direction from that perspective. So I'm gonna turn it over to Rose now so she can share with you uh, the data that we're seeing at the Navajo Nation. Good afternoon. Um, and thank you for this time, Mayor and Council. And I just wanna also want to, my name is Rose Tohi and Coordinator for Indigenous Initiatives. I also want to um, welcome you to March. We call it Wojjin, and this is the time of year the young eaglets um, begin to make their cries, so um, making their voices known. So I just wanted to share that with you. Um, with the graphs, you with the chart you see here is on Navajo Nation, this is regarding um, the count for last week, um, 2000 or February 24th. Um, as you can see, the, te the testing is still going up. Um, however, as far as the testing is concerned, this one only has 8,000, where, whereas the previous report had nearly 16,000, and then um, which may contribute to the confirmed positive cases at 795. And the previous one um, at that same 14-day count was um, 2,498. So just wanted to clear, um, give you a little picture on that. The deaths um, are 17 this time, as well as the last 14 days were also at 17. To Hopi. And this is where you see the, um, the cumulative positive totals at 2,561, 25, 25, with it, it being increased to 50, by 54. And then the 14 day count is also um, active cases at 113 with a decrease of 61. And then also um, the seven day active cases with a decrease of 26. And that is at 35. They were Hopi tribe reports 78%, 78 78.404, oh, sorry, um, total population vaccinated. And then also with that eligible vaccination is at 79.64%. And then as far as the, the Navajo Nation of the next slide, um, as you see, there's the 46% or 42% of the Delta variant um, are of the 33. Boy, I'm really messing this up, huh? <laughs> Maybe it's the first of March. Sorry about that. So Navajo Nation is at 42% 40, of the 3,351 um, 3, samples tested with the Delta variant. And then again, 39% um, of that, of those samples were, were the Omicron variant. And then the 65.2% of the total population of vaccinated. Again, Safer at Home is still um, in effect. And that basically means that the um, <clears throat> that the people are to exercise personal responsibilities, um, face masking are, is still mandatory. Public health uh, emergency orders to remain the same for schools at red status and orange status for businesses. Uh, for schools, that means to um, really be consistent with the safe schools framework, um, which also includes um, hybrid and virtual learning. For businesses, it is for it is to be open at 50% maximum capacity. Health advisory for 52 <clears throat> communities. This is good news. It's a decrease by 31 um, communities, and then the um, the ARPA hardship assistance checks have been released, and this first round is going to the elders, and then after that is um, the rest of the enrolled members of Navajo Nation. And um, 
And I'm sure a lot of that will be spent here in Flagstaff. Yay. <clears throat> and then as far as the next Hopi tribe is concerned, they are still in phase two of reopening. And that is on until March 13th. And this is when um, January 14th is when the Hopi tribal chairman um, had ordered this phase two um, transition. And that's what I have. And thank you for your time. I appreciate um, you excusing my stumbling over my words today. No thank worries. You. Thank you, Rose. Thanks, Rose. Um, so council for you next, we have our COVID-19 discussion. Uh, the CDC um, has updated the tools that we're going to use to measure the impact of the COVID-19 illness. Um, it helps communities decide what prevention steps to take um, based on data that is related to the number of new cases as well as hospitalization. Um, the levels that you'll see in the chart on the next slide, um, you'll see are low, medium, or high. Um, so similar terminology, but it's looking at different things to measure. Um, and it's determined by the consideration of the number of hospital beds being used. So similar to what we look at here at our FMC, um, hospital admissions, and then the total number of new COVID-19 cases. I've included the website uh, where this new information can be found uh, for you or any of our community members who might be interested in reading more details about this new community level. Um, the chart actually looks like this. Uh, the, the way to use it is on the far left. Um, the first thing you're looking at is there are fewer than 200 per 100,000 cases in the past seven days or are there 200 or more? And so then that tells you um, what you look at next as far as the indicators. And the indicators are actually um, looking at the level of hospitalization um, as well as the percent of beds that are occupied by individuals who've been diagnosed with COVID-19. And so, um, Looking at those percentages and numbers, then you would determine are you in low, medium, or high. One of the great things is that they are collecting data um, that allows you to go into the CDC website. You would put in your location. So here we've selected Arizona, Coconino County, and they're telling us that we are at medium community level. And then they tell you what you'll want to do um, to prevent the spread of COVID. Um, and so this is, I think, helpful that everyone can be uh, using the same site. Um, I do appreciate uh, that, again, people can choose to mask at any time. Uh, definitely, I think all of the messaging that uh, we've been seeing, whether it's from the CDC or a Coconino County Health and Human Services, is making sure that folks feel comfortable and encouraged um, to protect themselves to the level that they believe is necessary. Um, so looking at uh, what prevention steps uh, is recommended based on the community level. Again, we're here at medium. So if folks are at high risk or they have a severe illness, they suggest that they're checking in with their provider to determine to what level uh, they'll want to mask. Um, again, suggesting COVID vaccines as a way to protect yourself um, and to be sure that you're getting tested if you are experiencing any COVID-like symptoms. Uh, so given these new changes uh, that were uh, shared by the CDC on Friday, February 25th, um, city staff would like to recommend that effective Monday, March 7th, that we update our mask requirements for city facilities to match the updated CDC guidelines. Um, the reason that we're asking for a few work days before this is changed is we want to be sure that um, if our employees need accommodations to make sure that they are safe while at work, that we have time to work through that process and answer their questions and make sure we have a plan in place. Um, we also want to be sure that staff are trained on the new guidelines so that they can they understand and can answer questions from our community members. And it also gives us a little bit of time to be sure that we're pulling down outdate, outdated signage um, throughout all of our city facilities. 
one of the things that we wanted to call out here um, is just a reminder that the airport is governed uh, by the Transportation Security Administration, or better known as TSA, um, and those requirements are going to continue to require masks until updated. Um, that current requirement is actually scheduled um, to expire on March 18th, um, so we'll be watching uh, and listening to determine if that will be renewed or if they will make changes to their requirements as well. Um, and then the last piece is a reminder that we want to be sure that customers and employees feel welcome um, to wear masks to their level of comfort as they enter our facilities. So that is the end of our presentation. As always, we're here to answer questions that council might have. Um, and I will turn it back over to you, Mayor Deasy. Thank you, Shannon. Um, council, do we have any questions, um, comments as well? Vice Mayor. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Shannon. Are we able to pull Flagstaff numbers out of the Coconino County numbers? I'm just wondering how we um, stack up to the overall Coconino County numbers. Uh, so Flagstaff is the majority of those numbers. Um, in the 267 that were reported for this last week, 135 of those were in Flagstaff. Um, and then 88 of those were in the tribal communities. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Others? Uh, Councilman Raslin. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you all there. Um, I support staff recommendations on this. Um, as everybody knows, for the last several weeks, I have been broadcasting my optimism that we would be reaching this point soon, and here we are. Um, very enthusiastic to be supporting staff recommendations. I think they're perfectly in line with the CDC updated guidelines. Um, I think it's a measured approach, and uh, I wanted to say that, uh, you know, for a long time now, I, I've mentioned this before, um, following CDC guidelines kind of uh, provides a double-edged sword. Um, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. You sort of uh, live by the sword, die by the sword. Um, but I do believe we are at a point where we are emerging from the public health crisis phase of the pandemic, and we need to celebrate our victories. We need to acknowledge that we've done a really good job here at the city of, of Flagstaff in mitigating this public health emergency. We have been very responsible. We have been very cautious. Um, I personally feel that I have been one of the strongest proponents for taking this public health emergency very seriously all throughout. And it's time to acknowledge that we're emerging from the moment when it is government's prerogative to mandate how people react and assess their own risk uh, assessments for the public health uh, scenarios. Um, obviously, if someone feels more comfortable wearing a mask indoors while we're at medium level or low level, that is completely up to them. Um, absolutely fine, but we should also be ready to step back from making mask wearing mandatory, especially when the CDC guidelines are in line with those recommendations. We have the school district making the same move. What I'm hearing now, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems uh, if uh, I can't back up through the slides, the, the Hopi tribe in the next couple of weeks is moving up through their phases. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, until the middle of the month and uh, we'll see what happens elsewhere. We have a lot of states that have led the way in monitoring the public health emergency that are now lifting these restrictions. And I believe it is appropriate for the city of Flagstaff to do the same. Thank you very much. You have Councilman McCarthy. So the way I've interpreted the uh, staff recommendation is that in a week, March 7th, that we will make masks at all city facilities uh, optional at the person's uh, discretion. 
So I do support that. Thank you, Councilmember McCarthy. Councilmember Schmoney. Good afternoon, everybody. Good to be here in person. Um, yeah, gosh, Councilmember Aslan, thank you for your comments. You know, I, I struggle calling this a victory. I still feel like we're very much in the heat of the battle. You know, I had a good talk last night with President Nez down at the uh, 4A Lady Eagles State Championship game, which they almost won, and it was a great game. Uh, go Eagles, very proud. But uh, President Nez was very clear to me that they're not planning to remove their mask mandate. And I was joking with them saying, you know, Flagstaff's kind of the collision point between Phoenix and our tribal partners in the north. And um, I do believe that staff's recommendation is on point and I'm really struggling with this myself, but uh, I definitely have mixed feelings as we're moving forward and in concerns, but I do think it is time and there's obviously a lot of momentum behind this and I don't think that I'm willing to get in the way of that momentum at this point and don't think that we should either. But uh, yeah, I, I, I just wanna make it clear that I don't think we're through this pandemic and there might be a time in the future where we do have to require masks again, but hopefully just like the hybrid setting that we have for council meetings, we can kind of bounce back and forth. Um, but those were my thoughts and just wanted to share that with everybody. Um, but I guess, I guess in closing, I do support staff's recommendation, but I'm really curious to hear what others on council think. I'm still somewhat torn. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Shimani. Others? Council Member Sweet. Thank you. Uh, wow, it's been a long road, and I've had to battle this with my business and being a council member, and it's tough. But I do, at this point, support staff recommendations. I think it is time. Um, of course, if you want to wear a mask and that makes you feel more comfortable, please. Um, we are here to support that as well. Um, thank you. That's it. Good. Uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, too, agree with um, staff recommendations. And I would just like to say thank you to staff for all of your efforts over these couple of years. And again, not to say that everything's done, but you all have um, responded to every change and have done such an excellent job of keeping um, our employees and um, everyone coming into our facilities safe and keeping council very updated on the latest um, news regarding the pandemic. So I just wanna say thank you and I am in agreement with your um, recommendations. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Council Member Salas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I strongly support staff recommendation as well. And as uh, we move forward, uh, perhaps at our next COVID-19 update, uh, consider, uh, um, I would encourage staff to uh, make recommendations about our re-entry phase. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Sals. I think it's my turn now to weigh in here. Um, the one addendum I would like to place is that really pointing out that bottom bullet point. Customer employees, welcome to, not welcome to wear masks, but we need to make sure that people feel comfortable in our city facilities. I have certainly received quite a few emails of people who have been, uh, been upset and fearful of coming into our facilities if masks were to be removed or the mask mandate or mask requirements to be removed. I would like to request that N95 masks, full noise approved N95 masks be available to anyone who enters our facilities who wants that added protection. We have individuals in our community who have gotten a lung transplant, who are recovering from cancer, who would still like to go into our library and be able to get a book and feel safe in doing so, and don't have access to N95s or even KN95s. So my request would be that if we're going this route, which it does seem we are,
that the in-city facilities full-fledged N95 masks are available upon request to anyone entering our facilities so that way we can, we can maintain our inclusive uh, nature in our facilities and ensure that people can maximize their level of comfort in accessing services that we provide as a city. And that, that would be my one request through that process that I would like to hear from council and council member Shimoni. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Shan, I, I guess I'm curious what your thoughts are on that request. Do we have the supply? Is that something we can do easily? Uh, so thanks for the question, Council Member Shimoni. Uh, we've been actually handing out uh, surgical masks, not the N95 or the KN95 masks, um, just because of the cost. Um, and oftentimes we were hearing from those who work in our facilities that they would hand a mask to an individual. And as soon as they were out of sight of that staff member, it would be thrown on the floor. Um, so we have not been providing this level of mass to our public. We certainly have had them available to employees. Um, but if I recall, uh, we did have a um, smaller amount of the N95s, and I think we were looking at ordering some more. Um, I might call a friend and maybe um, or another one of our team members might be able to give us an update on that. Hi, Shannon. Um, this is Stace, and um, I'm not aware of us doing any purchase, and, and thanks, Maria, for joining in. But um, And I know DEMA will not um, provide reimbursement at this point with the new CDC, So, um, and I'll, I'll look to Maria uh, if she has any new information. Hopefully that helped a little bit, but nothing that I'm aware of at this time. Hi, good Good afternoon. Um, we do have a small supply of N95s here with written risk management, and we have distributed some of those to the departments who wanted them for employees who felt more comfortable wearing them, strictly on a voluntary basis, but we do have some. So two quick questions. Uh, do we know any price estimates in terms of what it costs to order 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 masks, K95s? Um, I want to say um, it was a, just under $2,000 for a, I'm about 1,500 masks. I'd have to go back and look. Okay, thank you. So, Mayor, I would support that, um, and I would support us using our council initiative fund uh, balance, which is $25,000, I believe, if we need to, to find the money to support that order and, and have them available, not necessarily pass them out as a, here you go, welcome to the library, but at least it's available with the surgical masks, as you said. And then um, the other comment I had, just taking your idea to another, another step, is just, Shannon, I'm wondering if all of our outfacing engagement where we have meetings between staff and the public, our staff can almost have a, a little training on, you know, how to ask what the person's comfort level is and say, you know, would you like to wear a mask? We have these two options and basically leave it up to that, the client. And then we kind of, you know, fall into however we feel comfortable as well, but letting them kind of determine their comfort level. Um, Shan, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, Council Member Shimoni, I think it uh, is kind when you're meeting with, you know, a smaller group or a group of individuals to ask their comfort. Um, certainly have been seeing uh, individuals do that when I'm attending meetings in other locations. So um, I think we can ask our division directors to work with their staff to be sure that as we're kind of in this transition phase that we're in, we're asking uh, individuals comfort level. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Shimoni. And um, I, I will just note that, yes, this is a thing to it is upon request. Um, not necessarily here, everyone gets an N95 that they're gonna throw on the floor right away. Still have those surgical masks available for individuals who prefer that, but this would be for people who would truly value them and feel safer for them. So uh, I, I appreciate the, the support in that and just wanna clarify this isn't something that, you know, we're gonna be dropping 10,000 N95s per, per week or something on. So uh, city manager and then council member McCarthy. Thank you, Mayor Council. Uh, I think at some point we'll need a head count. Uh, there's been a mm -hmm. suggestion uh, to uh, continue with the provision of N95 masks, actually uh, to, to augment our supply and to, to uh, 
cost that out of the council initiatives. And then real fast in response to council member um, Salas's uh, suggestion and thank you. Uh, we will be circling back on the re-entry plan. Uh, our team needs to reconvene and discuss, but you can expect that conversation in the near, near future. Thanks. Thank you. Councilmember McCarthy. Well, I want to address this issue of the availability of the N95 mask. Uh, Mayor, correct me if I'm wrong, but you received for the city a very large number of these masks, and you've been giving them out in groups of five or six, whatever, on Sundays. Uh, so my question is, the, if we had those masks, do we, is that supply still available, or have they all been given out? And is that effort that you're uh, heading up continuing? Thank you for the question. Uh, those masks have been handed out at this point. Um, and we're not seeing any furtherance of those mask supplies coming in. Um, so that, that would not be available for city facilities at this point. And I would like to just point out that the council had a previous discussion on that. And it was decided that we would not give those masks out in the way that you gave them out, but you went ahead and did it anyway. That's correct. Because that was not done on city facilities. That was me as a private citizen that received a donation and utilized that to the best betterment that myself and NAH felt, which would be to supply people with masks and five packs to uh, those who would need it in our community that were facing difficulties either financially or just basic access to find them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Shimoni. Really quick, Councilmember McCarthy, just a follow-up to that thought. You know, I just want to let Council know, I, if we do go the, down the path of soliciting donations from F, um, FMC, I would rather us not do that for this purpose. And Mayor, I'm glad to hear you, see you shaking your head no. I think we need to pay for these, and I fully support us doing that. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and that was an external mass distribution effort that we had decided upon, not you know just within our city facilities, which I feel is you know our our responsibility if that's what it's going to be. Vice Mayor. I'm in support of using our council funds to purchase some um, masks that be, can be given out to the public if they'd feel more comfortable having them. Thank you, Vice Mayor. And Council Member Sweet. I'm in support as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that does bring us to a uh, consensus on that front. And thank you, Council. Actually, not consensus, majority. Majority, yes. All right. With that, I do want to mention the Senior Center. I know we're going to be discussing the reentry plan, but uh, we have been getting, uh, I've, I've gotten some notifications about wanting to reopen the senior center, which um, I believe it is time to do so. A lot of individuals were uh, wanting that and requesting it, and I, I think it's time, so please uh, have that on the forefront as we deal with the reentry plan in the coming week, and I know it takes time for staffing, et cetera. So, all right. Mayor, I see that uh, Rebecca Sayers might have comments about that, if uh, oh, you'd like to hear those. thank yeah. you, yes. Um, Ms. Sayers, please. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Rebecca Sayers, Parks, Recreation, Open Space, and Events uh, Division Director. So we were just discussing this um, yesterday and today. We are certainly in partnership with the county on the decision for the lunch program, but we are... Uh, planning to reopen our doors, uh, hopefully on Monday, assuming that we can align staff in time. Excellent. Thank you so much for the update. Uh, you bet. Councilmember Schmoney. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you know, just before we move on from this topic, uh, City Manager and, and Deputy City Manager Anderson, I'm just wondering, you know, are, are we basically planning to um, do what we can with each of our facilities as of next Monday with the, the mask changes? That, that, we might have already mentioned this, but um, is that basically what we're doing? So Council Member Shimoni, um, the recreation and library facilities have been operating under a tier program. 
Um, so sliding back and forth with the number of individuals um, permitted in the center, the types of services that they are providing, um, the cleaning schedule, uh, spacing out of individuals, they've been um, moving back and forth through those tiers based on what we're seeing uh, with COVID-19 numbers um, in the various types of mitigation, you know, amount of hospitalization, number of COVID-related deaths. Um, so they are able to move back and forth with those tiers without impacting um, what we do from a reentry phase perspective. Um, realizing that there's a lot of different types of activities that happen within recreation um, and library facilities. When we developed the reentry plan, we gave them that flexibility. It does not mean that this coming Monday that we're going to open up all of our city services. We really look at these on a case by case basis and determine what we can do safely uh, to make sure that individuals coming into our facility, both staff and community members, um, won't be at risk for uh, COVID-19 exposure. I hope that answers your question. And can you just speak to the mask requirement component of, of our operations? Uh, so masks, um, right now, you have to wear a mask in city facilities. Uh, what we proposed, which I believe was supported by council, is that this coming Monday, it will be up to the customer and the employee as to whether or not they want a mask while they're in our facilities. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, council member. Uh, any further direction needed on our behalf from, from council for staff? No, Mayor, thank you. Thank you, just wanted to clarify. Well, we'll take do a council liaison reports real quick and then take a, take a break thereafter. Um, so with that, um, Council Liaison reports if um, Council Member Aslan, if you'd like to start us off. Oh, thank you very much, but I'm okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Shimoni. Oh, dang. <laughs> I am not prepared. Can you actually circle back yeah, to me? Yeah, I'll uh, circle back. Uh, Vice Mayor? Thank you, Mayor. My only update is just to remind the public that the Open Space Commission still has uh, open seats available. And I encourage those who are interested in open space to apply for one of those seats. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, Council Member McCarthy. Uh, nothing tonight, Mayor, thank you. Okay. Council Member Sweet. Thank you. I attended the NACOG Regional Council meeting and the staffing issues throughout that organization are still happening and Boy, are they maneuvering right and left to get positions filled, um, get creative with not having to close down programs. And um, it's important. Uh, Head Start is under NACOG. And so I really encourage if you are looking for employment, that is one area that you could go to as well as the city. Um, and they're just doing a fantastic job of really um, maneuvering around this. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Salas? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yesterday, the Parks and, Rec Parks and Recreation Commi Commission meeting um, uh, had a meeting. Uh, they, uh, they had a, a, an overview. They received an overview of the, the city budget process and look into uh, the big picture of unfunded uh, capital uh, improvement projects and um, and the BBB Recreation Fund uh, that um, goes to, uh, well, 78% of the BBB Recreation Fund goes to maintenance, meaning there's less funds for deferred maintenance and capital improvement uh, down, down the road. Um, they also look uh, into uh, um, identifying priorities eventually uh, as they would recommend to council in terms of uh, the um, unfunded projects in our capital improvement uh, program uh, five year uh, and put forth recommendation in the future. Um, also, um, thanks to our pros team, they are leading uh, uh, an uh, outreach effort in, in partnership with the consultant on community engagement 
toward the planning or uh, visioning the future of Thorpe Park Annex. So that's tomorrow afternoon and Saturday morning. And the information is available on the city website and our Facebook page as well, I think. I believe so, yes, right, so. That's all, and tomorrow we will have our Metro Plan Executive Board meeting, and next week I will attend the Economic Collaborative of Northern Arizona Board meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Councilmember Schmuck. Okay, I'm ready. Um, a few things. The Differently Able Commission has, is asking the community for applications, and so if you are interested in serving on that commission, please do engage and apply. Uh, Mountain Line did release our $2 uh, transit opportunity, which is a pilot that we're, we're doing through, I think, the end of June. And basically, this pilot, can, this little shuttle can basically pick you up at your home, at your residence within the city limits, and take you to the airport, or take you from the airport anywhere within city limits for $2. And so, download the app, uh, spread the word, and, and utilize this amazing opportunity, this amazing pilot that hopefully we'll figure out through the data and the funding how to make this resilient moving forward for the airport and, and much more. There's also supporting uh, Joycone and that facility through this pilot as well. So we're hoping not only to focus on airport, but, but local regional business uh, employees. And so this is really exciting stuff and this could really impact our roadways and our traffic volumes moving forward. Um, I just want to express gratitude to the county for their COVID updates. Uh, myself and Councilmember Sweet were able to attend last one with WC Manager Anderson, and they do a great job. So thank you to the county. That was last a couple days ago, I think yesterday actually. <laughs> and uh, the Indigenous Commission's meeting tomorrow from 11 to 1 p.m., and I welcome anyone to join us, along with the Transportation Commission, as well as meeting tomorrow from 4 to 6 p.m. Uh, there's a CJCC coordinator interview this Thursday that I'll be attending. We're reviewing a few coordinators, and since we made that position a joint thing with the county opportunity and also a virtual remote job opportunity, we're actually seeing a lot of candidates. And so it's really exciting to see that opportunity that remote uh, work is, is providing us here with our CJCC. And our Bicycle Advisory Committee meets this Thursday from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. Again, those are all open to the public meetings. And uh, our Coconino County 911 Diversion Group meets this Monday that I'm a part of. That's my update. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Shimoni. Well, uh, I'll finish off here. I want to note that our Inclusion and Adaptive Living uh, Commission that I was in attendance at last Tuesday could not meet because of quorum, uh, because we are missing three individuals, uh, or there's three spaces on it right now. So we're to a critical level that really, if you, you're interested in um, issues of inclusion in our community, those who may be differently abled, um, I mean, right now as it stands, if only one person isn't able to make it, we can't actually meet. And we did have a really great agenda last week uh, prepared. So um, just really urging anyone to uh, please apply to that commission. And um, just note that you can actually be on standing commissions already and still be uh, serving. You can serve on more than one commission. So uh, I'm emerging individuals who are also showing the, uh, that dedication and volunteerism in other areas in our community. Uh, I, was, I heard that people were not aware of that. So I just wanna put in that plug and hopefully we can um, have, have a good meeting next time with uh, more individuals. So with that, um, I think it is a good, um, uh, I think that is a good time for us to take a little break. So uh, it's 5.15, we will meet back here at 5.30 sharp. All right, are we uh, good to start up here tech-wise? We should be good to go, Mayor. All right, it's uh, 5.34, so we can uh, start back at it here. We are down to agenda item number nine, which is our consent items. 
Um, and uh, I, unless anyone would like to pull it out, I do move to approve the recommended uh, recommendations listed on the agenda. And I'll wait a second here. Jimoni's jumping in. <laughs> So I do have a motion on the table to approve the consent items as listed. Councilmember Shmoney. Thank you, Mayor. I, I, was just thinking of, I was just thinking about Dean and how he wouldn't appreciate me running down the hallway without my <laughs> helmet on. Um, but I'd like to just pull 9B if I can. Certainly. Uh, is there any interest in others being pulled out before we um, make the motion for the rest? or complete the motion. All right, well, uh, 9B, so the public knows this is the consideration and approval of final plat, request for Hunt Beaver LLC for approval of the final plat for Beaver Street condos, case number PZ-17-00187-05, an eight unit residential condominium subdivision located at 613 North Beaver Street on a uh, third of an acre in the T4N1 transect zone. Thank you, Thank Mayor. You. Oh, Ms. Oh, Saltzberg. Go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. Would it be possible to get an action on the motion mm -hmm. to approve the other items of consent and then have that one separately, please? Yes. Thank so uh, the motion's on the table. I move to approve the recommendations for uh, agenda items 9A, C, and D. I'll second. Seconded by Council Member Sweet. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Thank you, All Mayor. Right. Council Member Shimoni, your question. Thank you. And, and hi, Genevieve. Welcome. Uh, thank you for being here. You know, my, my question, Mayor and Council and the community, is just in regards to the number of bathrooms at this project. Uh, if you, it, it is under construction, so it's not something I'm looking to change. But I just wanted to take a moment to bring awareness to this. It's a three-bedroom complex. You know, I think it has eight, I think it's got eight three-bedroom units, if I'm not mistaken. I see you nodding your head. But each of those units has four ba bathrooms. So four bathrooms, three bedrooms. And I guess my question, Genevieve, is, is why would someone do this? Do you have any thoughts? Is this something that happens often around the city? And, and is this something that we can address in the code moving forward? You know, I, I struggle with a one-to-one -one ratio and a 125% ratio or however that calculates is just that much more concerning to me in terms of the project's affordability I know that additional bathrooms cost money, and I just wanted to raise awareness to this. Do, do you have any thoughts on my questions? Sure. Uh, thank you, Council Member Shimoni, Genevieve Pair 3, current planning section. Um, so this is a somewhat unique project. It is taking advantage of the transect zone development standards or using the townhome building type, which we don't see too often uh, these days in Flagstaff for new projects. So. Um, a couple of things that make this project unique, and, and the applicant is on the phone as well, so they can talk about this too if I miss anything. Uh, so the first floor, half of it is a garage and half of it is a bedroom. Garages by building code can't open directly onto bedrooms, so they have stairs that go up from the garage and then go down into the bedroom. So there's a bathroom on the first floor for that first floor bedroom, and then the second floor is the kitchen, dining, living room area, they have a bathroom there, and there's um, two more bedrooms on the third floor, so they each have bathrooms there. So in this case, it's kind of a unique layout. It, that's not really a common layout for multifamily. I, I'm not aware of any other projects that have that layout. So I do think this is a unique case. It's not something we're seeing super common in other developments. It's just this one is that infill project taking advantage of the transect zone standards, townhouse building type, while also providing that garage. So this is kind of an interesting layout. Okay, thank you. And, and Mayor, if it's appropriate, I'd love to welcome the developer to, to add in any other comments as to why this approach and the benefits of this approach, if, if, if that's appropriate. Yep, if they are on the line, um, please feel free to, to jump in to address. Got some more money. Sure, is someone from SWI oh. or Hunt B okay. Beaver LLC here? All right, we're here in person, yeah. <laughs> Getting used to the new hybrid again, I guess. <laughs> Thanks for being here. 
Yeah, Hi, thank you. I'm uh, Pete Muscarella with Straight Line Builders, and we're the builder on the project, as well as my two brothers are the owners of the project. And the concept of the, the, the project is that the people can come in and they'll have three master bedrooms, so you can have three three bedrooms, a full bedroom in each, or a full bathroom in each bedroom. But what that does is it leaves the main level with no bathroom, and it's the main, that's your main entertainment level with everything. So if you were to not have the powder room, it's a powder room, it's not a full bathroom, it's just a toilet and a sink. And so that leaves that up on the, the main entertainment level which is the living room, dining room, and kitchen, and it's got two walkout patios and stuff. And if you didn't have that, they'd have to walk downstairs through the bedroom to go to the bathroom or upstairs through one of the bedrooms to go to the bathroom. That's great. And, and I understand this is a little bit of a funky layout, so that makes a lot of sense. Right. Um, and, and I appreciate you being here and being able to answer my question. Um, that, that answers my question there in council, and, and uh, I think that makes sense, and uh, I appreciate it. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you for the explanation. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right. With that, I move to uh, approve the final plat, uh, uh, agenda item 9B, the consideration approval of final plat from Hunt Beaver, LLC. I'll second. Seconded by council member Sweet. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries unanimously. That does bring us down to agenda item number 10A of our routine items. This is the consideration and approval of contract for the Lone Tree Overpass Project. Award of the Second Amendment to the Design Build Services Agreement to Ames Construction in an amount not to exceed $5,905,357.86. Staff recommended action is to award uh, award of the Second Amendment to the Design Build Services Agreement to Ames Construction in that amount and to authorize the city manager to execute the necessary documents. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council, Vice Mayor. Um, my name is Christine Cameron. I'm a project manager with Capital Improvements. And this item is... Um, this item is for the award of um, what we are considering hopefully the final design phase uh, for the Lone Tree Overpass. Uh, and this takes us through substantial completion um, on design. So it, it will include um, rail roadway and intersection design, BNSF and Army Corps coordination along with other stakeholders, um, the completion of the economic impact study, uh, environmental clearance of properties, public involvement, utility and drainage design, uh, landscape and beautification elements, and right-of-way relocation and, um, and acquisition services. So the scope is fairly uh, extensive with this contract. Um, so in January, when we were here, um, or virtually, uh, presenting the, the intersection alternatives, we spoke about um, that we would, you know, take the time that was needed to really go through the Lone Tree and Butler intersections and uh, design that um, you know, as, as it needs to be designed, but it's also critical to move forward with the overall design uh, to keep our commitment, excuse me, to the voters and also to keep in step with other projects like the Rio, Rio de Flag. So this amendment covers um, both the work to ensure that, 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 that intersection is designed to councils and community standards, and um, it also allows us to proceed on the overall project. Uh, so we anticipate that we'll be back before you in May uh, to present this intersection design. Uh, and we also hope to wrap up uh, the full design um, somewhere around this time next year. Um, I do have a quick plug before I end. We do have a survey online right now uh, for the beautification elements. Uh, Jana Weldon with beautification and our uh, wheat design, our subconsultant has put that out and it's available till March 11th on uh, the LoneTreeOverpass.org site. And I think it's also linked on our um, our Facebook page for the Flagstaff City Government. So I would invite everyone to, um, to visit and, and give us your thoughts on the beautification elements. And uh, we've got Jason Karloftis and Chris Kane from the construction and the design team um, on the line. Excellent, thank you. <coughs> Council, do we have any uh, questions regarding this? <laughs> Other than Shimoni. 
I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead, council member. This is like the story of my, my like, education life. Teachers would always be like, all right, other than Adam, does anyone else have a question? <laughs> I guess things don't change. Um, and yeah, I, I guess I'll jump in. Thank you. Uh, very exciting reading this packet. A lot of information in that scope of work. Wow. Uh, it seems like we're really doing this the right way. I love that we're translating things in our public outreach. I, I just think that the communication here is on point. Um, very excited about this, this next <coughs> chapter for the Lone Tree Overpass. And, and I think that this will get us to the finish line successfully, co collectively as a community and as a council. It's, it's really exciting. I do have a couple questions. The, I, I read that there's a third and a fourth option. Uh, what? <laughs> I, I, I assume that that question may come up, uh, Council Member Shimani. So um, we are sticking to the council's preferred option of option five is, is our first um, preference, what we're moving forward with, and that, that provides five lanes on each of the four intersection legs. And then 5B, which adds one lane to the north leg and one lane to the east leg. And uh, so that would be, um, as Council Member Aslan kind of started this conversation in January, what would it look like? And I think he had, we had public comment to this effect too. What would it look like if we started small and we had to build out to something else? And so that is the, the other two options are showing you how we would move from five to five B if we wanted to do that in the future. And it entails, um, one of them entails um, space on the edges of the roadway to, to take up in the future. And the other one entails spaces within the center of the roadway to take up in the future. And so it's just different options. It's really, it's really just five and five B still, but those extra two options are just showing you how to move from one to the other as requested. Okay, yeah. gosh, I really got a little nervous when I saw that there were two <laughs> additional options. Um, but that, that's, I was hoping it was variants of five A and five B, so that's reassuring to hear. Um, and then I also wanted just to ask in the modeling used, you know, I saw that we were working with Metro Plan at times with the modeling. Do you know if we're going to be working with fears and peers through Metro Plan to identify some of the metrics that we could utilize? Council Member Shimoni, I have spoken with sustainability staff and with uh, David Westall about getting WSP hooked up with fair and peers um, in the appropriate manner um, if, if that needs to happen. So I, I don't think that that's something that, you know, that would be surprising if, if we pull that whole team together. That's great. And then uh, as one of the metrics, I'd love for us to do a, a cost analysis also with 5A and 5B. You know, if we're adding a lane on the bridge, what's, what's that cost? And, and same with, you know, from the east leg, if we're adding that sixth lane, you know, what's that cost? And, and give council those numbers so that we can talk about, you know, maybe wanna, we want to fund a park in the south side neighborhood under that bridge with that cost of that, that, that second double lane coming off the bridge. Maybe that's a priority versus that second lane. Maybe not, I don't know, but could, could, we, could we analyze those costs as well? Council Member Shimoni, the, the bridge will stay kind of in its concept form on the two lanes each direction. Um, it, we w really, the cost savings would be at the intersection level more so but we can address that in the future for you. So are you thinking that, that that potential, I think additional 12 feet of median along Lone Tree over the bridge wouldn't bring a significant cost? I think that it is required as we move north into the ADOT intersection. And I, I could have Jeff Bauman or uh, Jason Karloff just kind of speak to that. Uh, really both of them are on the line. Welcome to chime in if, if you would like. Mr. Bauman, or? Yeah, this is Jason Karloftis. Yes, uh, thank you, Councilmember Sh Shimoni. Um, Christine, you're correct. The uh, median, as we get to the north, the bridge is further north, closer to Route 66 than it is to the Butler intersection. So that median is really controlled by what's happening at the Route 66 Lone Tree intersection than it is at the Butler intersection. There would be some savings towards the Butler intersection, but that's really where that um, additional turn lane would be, and it tapers off fairly quickly as we go north and prior to where the bridge is occurring, currently as modeled. Um, but we would take a look at where that those limits would be as we're transitioning between 5A and 5B with those, those concepts. Okay. 
I think that that's good for me. Um, although I'd like to see that intersection and hopefully see if we can lessen that lane potentially. But if not, that's fine. Um, let me see. So let's see. Let me think for a second. Okay, I'm forgetting my, my other follow-up to the cost, but that's okay. Uh, I guess my other comment is in regards to the, and this, this might be for you, Jason, and thank you so much for being with us and taking on this project. This is a big one, and, and I appreciate you and the team working on this and really doing it right. I, I really do appreciate that. But uh, in, in regards to the travel demands and the adjustment of the modeling, can we look at a range of modeling that reflects the human behavior at the different uh, intersection options? I believe that's something that you all are familiar with doing. Is that correct? Um, if I could get you to clar ask you to clarify what do you mean by human behavior? You're looking for pedestrian use of the intersection, specifically with bicycle and pedestrians? No, like let's say 5A shows a significant backup in the current modeled numbers that we're using. Um, maybe we adjust the assumptions in the model so that it better reflects what human behavior would do so that it doesn't result in whatever the letter grade is for that option. I appreciate the uh, clarification. Um, yes, yeah, so I did talk to our traffic leads um, while we were I'm clarifying some of our scope. We do have three models we have previously run. We also talked to Metro Plan. Um, so we have three models where we already have some feedback of what the, the tendency will be when different decisions are made within the model. Um, and that is part of our scope. Once we get under final design is to really dig into that. And if we do have an intersection backup, where will that traffic tend to go within the model? and what tweaks and what adjustments can we make um, to the model to better address that. And I already talked to, to Dave Wessel and if he needs to rerun a model, that's a pretty quick um, a process for him after we make the tweaks to any models we have. We just need to determine what those uh, adjustments to the model will need to be. So we're prepared to do that with our scope that we've submitted this evening. Very good, and I'll just let you know, Jason, <laughs> Councilmember Sweet and I met with David not long ago, and, and he told us that the power's in your hands to tweak the model, so, and I told him that I'm being told it's in his hands, so it's just funny hearing you say that tonight, too, but uh, I trust the team to, to do what they can in, in addressing that model, and it sounds like you all are on that track, which is wonderful. In regards to the traffic signals, uh, I'd love for us to also do that through the lens of pedestrian comfort and prioritization. Um, and, and thinking specifically about the movement of bikes and ped and, and the alignment of that movement. I know Jason, we've communicated via email about this. Vancouver has a wonderful design for a intersection and they're really leading the way. And the big takeaway is that bikes have a very direct route and not some kind of crazy curved approach to the intersection with it to navigate through it, but it's a very direct straight away while also being a protected intersection and that pedestrians have a very separated avenue from the bike path and that where the bike path overlays with the pedestrian or the pedestrian crosses the bike path, it's clearly marked, it's clearly communicated. Just like a pedestrian crossing a road, it's very, very much clear that you're not in a pedestrian right of way. So I think Vancouver really offers us a really cool model. And Jason, I know you've communicated with me that the team's gonna look into aligning that bike lane the best they can through that intersection. And so I just wanted to take a moment here to just echo that request. And then, and then also the right turn lane, um, in terms of the comfort and potential crashes, if that right turn lane, if we can evaluate and bring back to council, the stopped at the red light versus the allowance of a right on red, I think can go a lot in the pedestrian safety category and in really the pedestrian comfort. And so, Jason, is that something we can bring back to council more details on? Uh, just, to, just to jump in here, um, as agendized, this is really about the administration of the contract uh, as opposed to some of the engineering standards um, that we had discussed. And again, these uh, are things that I think we can bring up at the uh, retreat uh, on March 31st. Uh, Ms. Cameron? Yeah, and we can have a conversation also. Council Member Shimoni. Very good, and that was my last comment, so I, I made it through my list. Thank you. Oh, yep. Thank you, Council Member. 
Um, with that, uh, any further questions? All right, well, I'd like to um, provide a motion to award the second amendment to the design build services agreement to Ames Construction in an amount not to exceed $5,905,357.86. I second that. And to authorize the city manager to execute the necessary documents. Second. Seconded by council member Shimoni. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries unanimously. We're Thank done to agenda item. Thank you, Ms. Cameron. Uh, agenda item 10B. This is an exciting one. Our consideration and adoption of ordinance number 2022-03. An ordinance of the city council, the city flagstaff, amending the flagstaff zoning map to rezone approximately 299.68 acres of real property generally located at 1900 North Gemini Drive, APN 101-37-002J, 107-01-001F, 107-01-001G, 101-37-001E, 101-37-002H, 101-28-007E, 107-01-001B, and 101-28-007C. I told you this was an exciting one. Mm -hmm. uh, and a portion of APN 110-08-001G and 109-02-001S from the Rural Residential Public Facility and Research and Development Zones with the Resource Protection Overlay to the Public Open Space Zone with the Resource Protection Overlay, providing for severability authority for clerical corrections and establishing an effective date. This is the McMillan Mesa Natural Area Concept Zoning Map Amendment. Ms. Pair 3. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Genevieve Pair 3, Senior Planner with the current planning section. Um, since this is a second read, I don't have a new presentation prepared, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Council, any questions at this time? Oh, we do have one, uh, have a virtual public comment on this item. So uh, we'll take it that before uh, moving forward. One moment, please. Mm -hmm. Mayor and Council, I have Mike Wilson. Mike Wilson, you may go ahead and address Mayor and Council. No, oh, thank you. Uh, Mayor DC, Vice Mayor Daggett, and council members, I appreciate the chance to uh, speak with you for a few moments on this agenda item. Um, my name is William Michael Wilson. I live on South Sherrill Drive in Flagstaff, and I'm the current chair of the Open Space Commission. I wanted to bring to the council's attention that the Open Spaces Commission supports the past 2022-03 that will rezone 299.68 acres on McMillan Mesa, known as the uh, McMillan Mesa Natural Area. Since the beginning of the rezoning uh, process, the commission has been involved with the Open Spaces Program in support of bringing this forward. I'm happy to report to council that at the regular commission's meeting last night, um, that there was a motion that was brought forward and approved in support of this effort. And uh, we as a commission felt it was important to let you, the city council, know this. Um, and I also hope that you'll indulge me for a moment. Uh, personally, I have a few thoughts. Um, getting to this point has been a very long but important journey. The journey began in 2016 with the approval of Prop 413. And tonight is the culmination of a lot of extremely hard work for many people, the citizens, the citizens of Flagstaff, city staff, the commission, the open spaces program, and ultimately you, the city council. I appreciate all the dedication and hard work by everyone involved and hope that at some point in the future that we will all be here again with the intent to save more areas for the enjoyment of all people, whether they live here or are visiting Flagstaff. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Chair Wilson. We greatly appreciate your advocacy. You're welcome. Oh, Vice Mayor. 
Yeah, go for it. I move that we read. Mayor, I believe we might have another public comment. Oh, we do? Okay, thank you. Jeez, Vice Mayor. <laughs> 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 Mayor and Council, I have Andy Bessler. Andy, you may go ahead and address Mayor and Council. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, Honorable Mayor and Council members, I appreciate your time uh, hearing my comment today. I'm speaking as an individual uh, and resident here in Flagstaff. I, I reside at 1255 North Hemlock Way. Uh, very glad. Uh, that we live on McMillan Mesa and grateful for the voters of Flagstaff to uh, set up this, uh, as, as Mike definitely mentioned, uh, you know, imp important resource for future generations. Uh, I just, just want to uh, say thank you to uh, all the folks who have uh, made this possible. And uh, as Prop 413 demonstrated, uh, the voters of Flagstaff overwhelmingly support uh, open space protection and designation. Uh, it's not often where a, a democratic vote of, of 86% would agree on anything, uh, especially today. Uh, so the demonstration of that vote really uh, showed me that we're, we're really following the public will. So I appreciate uh, everyone's help. And to help celebrate, uh, we're going to be having a celebration on April 9th uh, up at Buffalo Park at the Ramada, so everyone will be welcome. Uh, we'll be putting out public announcements soon, uh, and that's going to be really a fun way to celebrate uh, what I consider to be Flagstaff Central Park, uh, and I hope you can all join us there. Thanks. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate it. Uh, any further comment or public participants? No, that was all for today. All right. Vice Mayor has the floor. I would like to move that we read ordinance 2022-03 by title only for the final time. I second that motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Carries unanimously. City Clerk. An ordinance of I mean, the City yes. Council an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Flagstaff amending the Flagstaff zoning map to rezone approximately 299.68 acres of real property generally located at 1900 North Gemini Drive, APN 101-37-002J, 107-01-001F, 107-01-001G, 101-37-001E, 10137-002H, 101-28-007E, 101-107-01-001B, and 101-28-007C, and a portion of APN 110-08-001G and 109-02-001S from the Rural Residential RR Public Facility PF and Research and Development RD zones with a Resource Protection Overlay RPO to the Public Open Space POS zone with a Resource Protection Overlay RPO, providing for severability, authority for clerical corrections and establishing an effective date. Thank you, City Clerk. I think you missed a zero in there, so you're just going to have to repeat the whole thing again. <laughs> no, we're all good. You got it. <laughs> you got it on there. Well, uh, with that, you want to do the honors, Vice Mayor? I move that we adopt ordinance number 2022-03. I second that. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 That motion carry. Oh, any opposed? That motion carries unanimously. All right, moving right along to uh, agenda item 10C.
This is the consideration and adoption of resolution number 2022-05 and ordinance number 2022-04. A resolution of the City Council of the City of Flagstaff, Coconino County, Arizona, declaring as a public record that certain documents filed with the City Clerk and entitled PZ-21-00282 updates to zoning code, residential sustainable building incentives. In an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Flagstaff, Coconino County, Arizona, amending the Flagstaff City Code, Title 10, Flagstaff Zoning Code to modify the existing residential sustainable building incentives. Uh, staff recommended action is to adopt resolution number 2022-05 and read ordinance number 2022-04 by title only for the final time. Well, Stephen, take us away. Hello, good evening, Mayor and Council. I am here with Tiffany Antall, and we, I'm gonna give a very brief presentation mainly to explain uh, the information provided in the city council report that I provided this morning. Um, I know that it got a lot closer to today than I had wanted to, so I wanted to make sure we went over that information. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about, about rationale, about the EV charging station change discussed last meeting, um, and then I'll review again those requirements and standards. I did want to note that thanks to Tiffany and our city clerk, we did update the title in the materials to the Residential Sustainable Building Incentive, if adopted. So I will refer to that as we go. In terms of rationale, just to review, um, our building code is catching up to our incentives. This is a good thing. We want our building code um, to get stronger, to provide more energy efficient housing for our residents. This incentive is not commonly been used. It has only been used three times since its adoption in the last 12 years. Uh, we find some competition with the incentive for affordable housing. The incentive does not really reflect the priorities of the climate action, sorry, the carbon neutrality plan, um, particularly when we think about building electrification as well as vehicle electrification. And finally, we have uh, moved forward this process, this whole process of revision has been accelerated due to other developments that are moving forward and development agreements that we have. In terms of the EV charging, I just wanted to reflect here what City Council talked about um, two weeks ago, which was expanding it from one and two and three spaces to two, four, and six spaces, so essentially a doubling. These even numbers work out quite well um, because EV charging stations, uh, most of them come in two parts, right? And so they can charge one station, can charge two parking spaces. In terms of energy efficiency, that's where I'm gonna focus most of uh, my time today, and that's where the city council report also focused. There are three compliance paths to replace the former HIF, HIF, HERS 50 standard. I'm gonna go through each of these in detail. Before we started, I wanted to touch briefly on three concepts that will be helpful here. The first is a HERS rating. We talked a little bit about this last time. Um, this is really a, a measure of home energy efficiency as well as performance. So the reference home scores 100. A, a 100 score is for actually a, a home built to the 2006 International Energy Conservation Code. Going down from there, every drop in your HERS score is a 1% efficiency savings or an energy performance savings. Our building codes require a HERS 61. This is a 39% efficiency gain over a HERS 100. What's important to measure here is that HERS, while it does measure energy efficiency, it also measures energy performance. And so a building could be built to our building code. Um, our building code, again, is at a HERS 61. With the addition of solar, it would then get a lower HERS score. And so today, you could achieve a HERS 50 by adding solar, right, to your energy efficient project built to code. So I just wanna kind of add that nuance in there because sometimes folks think that HERS is an absolute guarantee of a certain type of efficiency, but it's actually a measure of both concepts. Finally, all electric buildings, we talked about this a little bit, but I just wanted to add this in here. It's really critical to the success of our carbon neutrality plan. We have in the carbon neutrality plan that we really need to incentivize building electrification. The reason that is we have limited control over what we can require for electrification. What we wanna do is incentivize it, particularly so that we can get buildings on the books that we can go see, right? That other builders can go see, that other builders can look and say, yes, they've done it. They've put in uh, high efficiency heat pumps, right? Uh, we want more of these in our community. We want this to be the standard for building, but we need to incentivize having more of it. 
Finally, third-party certification. Um, you know, I know that we are relying on a lot of different standards. That was what a lot of the questions last time relate to. That is really because, um, first of all, it's a best practice across the country. Um, a lot of cities rely on LEED certification or Energy Star, right, to be able to ensure performance, ensure quality, and also third-party certification can sometimes take the pressure off of staff, right, who may not have the time or the expertise and really say, we really believe in these standards, right? These standards have been developed by thousands and thousands of professionals, right, that, that contribute to the development of these standards. And so it is a leap of faith, I know, but um, we really stand behind what these standards mean. So I'm going to go just briefly through the three paths just to ensure we've got understanding. The first one's really simple, a zero energy building. This means that a building creates as much energy as it uses. That is generally done through the addition of on-site renewable energy. So here, that's normally solar, right? And so that means that at first, a building has to become really energy efficient. Normally, a building's getting to between HERS 40 and HERS 50. Then it will add solar to get down to that HERS zero to create all of the energy that it uses. Next, the second path, this is the all electric energy efficient building. The standard does have a lot going on. The first is, and I'm sorry, the first path does require all electric building. That's the case for all of these. In terms of path two, the first requirement is all electric construction. The second is the bronze certification of the National Green Building Standard. The National Green Building Standard requires a, a pretty much full building approach. So it's not just energy, right? This allows us to go beyond. Uh, we are, NGBS says that they get an average of 30% water savings from their projects. So the point here is really we are going beyond energy. In terms of a HERS score, an NGBS bronze gets about a HERS 52. Um, I want to specify that these are really estimates. It really depends on the building, um, but that's about how it gets us. But again, we see this to be a really well-rounded certification. In terms of the third path, this one also has a lot, um, but it's, it's really very standard EPA programs. So first, all electric construction, then Energy Star, Air Plus, and Water Sense. Again, we feel this is a really well-rounded sort of certification suite to ask for for these buildings. The HER score is a bit higher. It can be between 55 and 65. Um, but again, we feel that because of all of these, because of the water efficiency that you get, right, that also relates to energy. And so we, again, feel that what we want to do is provide flexibility to builders. Again, we want this incentive to be used, and it isn't currently, right? And so we want to provide builders with a number of different paths to get there. Finally, this is that table that I provided in the code. I realize that this is a lot, but last time I didn't give you a uh, sort of explanation of everything, right? So our building code, our existing incentive, which is HERS 50. Um, again, that's for, you know, you can get a proportion, uh, uh, sorry, a proportional density bonus for the number of units that you actually get to HERS 50, so it doesn't require a whole building approach. We would like for the, well, all three compliance paths offered are a whole building approach. Finally, the three proposed incentives that I just reviewed here, um, they're all electric, and then we try to ensure efficiency as well as other standards through each of those and the corresponding HERS rating. That is all I have for you today. Uh, and Tiffany and myself would be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you, Jenny. And uh, congrats on the five-year anniversary with the city, by the way. Thank you. Uh, Council, do we have uh, any questions? Councilor McCarthy. I just have a comment. We got uh, an email saying that, you know, we're making it more difficult and more expensive and whatever. Guess what? This is completely optional. So I think that's a very important point. If a builder doesn't want to do this, he doesn't have to. Well stated, Councilmember McCarthy. Councilmember Schmoney. Thank you, Mayor. And, and Jenny, yes, congratulations, and thank you for your work on this and, and your presentation tonight. Um, Councilmember McCarthy or she, <laughs> the developer could be a she. I agree. <laughs> or they. <laughs> or they. Um, <laughs> but uh, getting back to this, I, I, I like this a lot. And Mayor, when, when it's appropriate, I have a motion ready to go mm -hmm. to move this forward. Um, and I also just want to comment. I had heard that the Housing Commission wrestled with this and had some struggles. 
And um, Council, I don't necessarily think we should slow this down tonight, but what I'm thinking we should do is, is move forward with this and, and also task the Housing Commission with uh, working towards what those amendments might look like that they'd like to see us incorporate and bring those amendments back to us at a later date. Uh, there are projects that are relying on us moving forward with this tonight. And, uh, and I, I think that this is a very good ordinance and resolution for us to pursue. So, Mayor, you let me know when you're ready for a motion. And uh, those are my comments. Will do. Thank you, Councilmember Shmoney. Unless Councilmember Salas. Yeah, yeah, I have, um, I have a question, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, alluding to um, Councilmember Shimone's um, reference on uh, uh, the Housing Commission declined uh, to send a recommendation. I just want to have a, an understanding of why the Housing Commission declined to send a recommendation to Council to approve this um, new, new standards. Sure, thank you for the question, oh. um, Council Member Salas and, and- And Vice Mayor yes. Mike, or uh, yeah, either- <laughs> I, know she, I was, was going to say, I was going to start and say the Vice Mayor can, I know she was there, um, whatever your preference. My understanding based on the conversation, the discussion yesterday, that it revolved more around the commission not feeling like they had enough time to really thoroughly consider this. So it was more, they just didn't feel like they could come down one way or another. Um, not that they were necessarily opposed or in support of it. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember McCarthy? So as uh, Mr. Shimoni pointed out, I think it would be advisable to pass this tonight. Um, if the Housing Commission or anyone else has suggestions for amendments in the future, we can do that. Thank you, Councilmember McCarthy. Um, any further questions or comments? I would like to make one note. I apologize. Yeah. Of course. Thank, thank you so much. Um, so the affordable housing incentives are also going to be revised. And so that may be another point, right, where we can look at these two together and really have a comprehensive um, conversation. So I just wanted to know that and make sure that that was on um, council's radar. I, it, it, we may be many months out. Um, I, I'm not sure we staff has been able to pick that up yet, but that is going to be coming um, down the line. And that would be a perfect time to bring this back up to. Great. Perfect. With that, um, entertaining a motion here. Council Member Shimoni. I move that we adopt resolution number 2022-05. I second that. I'll beat you to it. Uh, <laughs> any uh, further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. That motion carries. Uh, that motion carries. Mayor, I'd like to read, move that we read ordinance number 2022 04 by towel only for the final time. Second. Seconded by McCarthy. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. That motion carries 6 1. City Clerk. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Flagstaff amending the Flagstaff City Code Title 10 Flagstaff Zoning Code by adopting by reference that certain document entitled PZ-21-00282 updates to Zoning Code Residential Sustainable Building Incentives, providing for penalties, repeal of conflicting ordinances, severability, and establishing an effective date. Thank you, City Clerk. Mayor, I move we adopt ordinance number 2022-04. I second that. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Nay. That motion carries 6-1. Thank you. With that, we are down to agenda item number 11. Uh, this is our 11A is our public hearing, consideration and adoption of ordinance number 2022-05. 
an ordinance of the city council of the city of Flagstaff amending the Flagstaff zoning map to rezone approximately 13.49 acres of real property generally located at 5531 East Cortland Boulevard, a portion of APN 113-37-001E from the highway commercial light industrial open and research and development zones to the high density residential zone with conditions providing for severability authority for clerical corrections and establishing an effective date. Uh, with that, I would like to open the public hearing and uh, yeah, hear from staff, Ms. Antle. Thank you so much, Mayor and Council. Tiffany Antle, Senior Planner with the City of with the Community Development Department here tonight to present the Lofts of Continental Concept Zoning Map Amendment. I'm gonna breeze through this presentation as fast as possible. I'd like to reserve as much time for the applicant. I know that they have a lot that they'd like to share with you and this honestly really is their case. So really quickly, property is located at 5531 East Cortland Boulevard. It is a portion of an existing um, overall 19.26 acre parcel. It is the 13.49 overall in red. That's the full 19.26 acres you'll see. The proposed use is a multifamily residential dwelling um, development that consists of 139 units. Just to the north of this property is Interstate 40. To the west is vacant commercial development, zoned highway commercial, and that will be the remainder of the parcel that you see located over here. And then further to the west is more commercial. Uh, there is vacant land to the east that is owned by the city of Flagstaff and is in the research and development in rural residential zones. And to the south, we have multifamily residential development, um, which is also zoned high density residential. The subject property right now has, is split with three different zoning categories on it, making it actually really to develop to, hard to develop under any zoning category as it currently exists. You'll see that a corner of the property is in research development, a portion of the property is in light industrial open, and then further another portion of the property is in highway commercial. All three of those districts do something very different. So there are two types of zoning map amendments. There's the direct ordinance with the site plan and concept zoning plan. You're all experts on this at this point, so I'll skip. Um, Lofset Continental concept plan, 139 units, 31 bedrooms, 79 two bedrooms, 33 bedrooms, 1.69 acres of open space, 0.56 acres of open space, 290 parking spaces. There's the parking calculations for you. Um, they're broken down by unit. Um, there is bicycle parking provided. Uh, there, I'll go over the bicycle parking again when I get to highlight what's in the development agreement. But essentially, 15 bike parking spaces are required. There's more provided. Um, and of course, this includes guest parking as well as ADA accessible spaces. These are the proposed building elevations. Staff has found them to be in compliance with our architectural design standards. We have actually approved similar um, architectural designs at another location in town. These will, similar buildings will be built on McMillan Mesa. They are townhome style, however, they're not townhomes. Uh, here is the concept resource protection plan. You can see in the corner of the property that is the cluster of trees that needs to be preserved on this site. Um, the, the site has also received its um, cultural resource clearance. Um, so the big story on this property is that the city has an easement, an 88 foot easement that traverses, that's the dark gray you're seeing on this map, that traverses this property that will access that adjacent vacant land that will hopefully one day be the most incredible regional park the city's ever seen. Um, until that day, um, we are not really in need of the road immediately, but we are in need of those rights. We have worked over this, the past several years, probably three now, um, to come up with an agreement to basically um, abandon that existing easement and replace it. And so we will, in, in the development agreement for this, we will be abandoning this 88 foot easement and replace, we will be receiving an unimproved 45 foot right of way that will be fee simple land. We can make full decisions about how we use that land in the future, um, how it'll be best to serve whatever we dip build to the east. In addition to that 45 feet, we are receiving a 20 foot foots easement that is set on the southern side of the parcel. 
Um, this was a hard fought discussion amongst all of us, but it was best felt that that foot's pulling it as far, farther away from I-40 would create the best atmosphere and environment for that foot's trail. Um, it'll also immediately serve both of those properties, those high density development properties, um, the one that we're currently looking at, as well as the one to the south. The other interesting fact about this foots trail is um, it is not a foots trail to nothing. This foots trail will connect to a series of social trails um, to the east. There are also planned trails through the city property currently ongoing, even though the, the park is not an immediate on the future checkbox, but those trails are in the planning stages now and will provide further access throughout the east um, through this foots trail. In addition, there's a sewer line improvement that will run along the eastern boundary of this property. That sewer main extension will include a road on top of it that will also serve as a de facto foots. So wherever we can get those connections, um, we do our best and we'll use those sewer main roads as well to act as a de facto foots trail in these instances. So just wanted to note that this is not a trail to anywhere. The developer has been gracious enough to agree to make this a concrete foots. Um, I know that this comes at a hardship and a cost to this developer and staff is very much appreciative of their um, ability to do that. So essentially a traffic impact analysis was not required for this project. They did do a traffic statement. There was one done previously for a larger proposed development on site, a second um, traffic statement was just done to verify that again, but this is a lower number of units, that there really are no mitigating impacts um, affiliated with this development that the existing tra transportation network can accommodate it. In terms of water sewer impact analysis, I mentioned they need to upgrade a sewer main. It will come at an, ex at an extensive cost. It's, it's a fairly lengthy um, extension. And um, originally, the sewer was going to be shared by two developments. The other development has yet to move forward and their site plan has expired. So in order for this project to move forward, it will be on the hook for the entire extension. Um, in terms of stormwater analysis, they did the, they're basically not doing a full drainage impact analysis. They're doing the difference between pre and post, which is typical on this size of development. Um, and an above ground detention basin is incorporated into the par property to uh, address all of the stormwater issues. So let's get to the findings. The first one is that it's consistent with the regional plan. So here is your regional plan. You can see that there is an activity center located at that intersection um, of Cortland and Continental. Um, the property is located just to the north. A small little piece of it falls in that activity center. It is in the suburban, existing suburban category, which basically supports medium to low densities and with a desired density of between two and 13. Both gross and net fall in that two and 13. Um, and we do fall just above the minimum density of the high density residential in terms of our gross, grosses with everything. Um, gross is just raw land and then net of course is after the right of way has been taken out of the project. So finding number two will not be detrimental to public health interest, safety, convenience, or welfare, and will add to the public good. So I'm gonna go over the public good here in a minute when we get to the development agreement, but I've, I've hinted at a couple so far. Concrete foots, um, ex extension or new right of way um, and replace some an existing easement. Um, so staff has identified that the community benefit that foots trail improvements to the existing sewer system as well as the provision of 14 affordable housing units um, and energy efficient features. Finding number three, that the site is physically suitable. Um, IDS does an extensive review. We have, we have not taken this all the way through site plan, but we've spent a lot of time on this property. We've looked at different proposals. Um, we're really glad we've landed where we are with this existing proposal. Um, IDS has determined that it will be um, in compliance with all codes and requirements, um, and we will look forward to hopefully seeing this in site plan process soon. Um, I covered that. And so here are the draft development agreement contents, and these really go towards that community benefit finding. So we have that offsite sewer modification. We have the dedication of that right of way, both improved and unimproved. Um, there's a com the cul-de-sac does need to be completed as part of this project. We have the 10-foot concrete foots. We have the 10% affordable units. 
We do have a materials management plan, including construction waste. Um, Energy Star certified units, the prohibition of short-term rentals, which would be for 60 days, uh, dog park with amenities for restaurants, the four electric vehicle ready outlets and two electric vehicle charging stations, 16 uncovered bicycle parking spaces and eight covered, um, as where only 15 are required and pollinator friendly landscaping. Um, in terms of the citizen participation plan, the applicant did hold the required neighborhood meeting. Nobody attended from the neighborhood. Um, they did prepare their report. We waived the second meeting because no one attended the first. Um, as of this, as of the Planning and Zoning Commission two weeks ago, I did receive one email that was a concern about just the way we posted the notice on the property. They never presented any concerns in relation to this case at all. Um, it's just that this property happens to be at the, at, at the end of a dead end, and so they would have rather have seen signage along the street. So staff's recommendation, um, the Planning and Zoning Commission by unanimous vote of five to zero did recommend that the City Council find the proposed zoning map amendments is, is in substantial conformance with the required findings and is recommending a rezoning and subject or in accordance with these five conditions. And I'd be happy to go over them if you like. If not, I can hand my time over to the applicant. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. Thank you, Ms. Antal. Well, uh, based on rules of procedures, we need to hear the applicant and then go back to questions for staff and the applic applicants. Thank you very much. And uh, just to remind, based on public hearing rules of procedures, uh, we typically are only have 10 minutes for applicant and for staff, but council is welcome to motion and increase the amount of time of for the presentation. So it just has to be a procedural vote. After the, once the 10 minutes is up, I'll, I'll signal and yeah, just, just so you're aware. <laughs> Council, my name is Charity Lee. I'm the Land Acquisition and Development Manager for Miramonte Homes. And um, to be respectful of your time tonight, I'm gonna skip over some of the slides if, um, that were duplicative. Um, that, that Tiffany already had addressed, and I'm happy to go over them if you would like or go back to them, but I'm just gonna kind of move through some of these a little quicker if you would like, or I can do the full presentation, it's your option. I, I think we're good with just jumping right in, and yeah, if it's duplicative, we can ask questions if we need gotcha. to afterward. So our project team, um, it, it consists of Miramonte Homes, Smogion Engineering, and Aspie Watkins and Diesel. And we already talked about tonight's purpose. It's for a zoning map amendment. And to address the housing crisis, we're gonna be bringing 139 unit multifamily development um, that also is sustainable and thoughtful. We've worked really hard on this development and we think it's gonna be a great addition to City of Flagstaff. We talked about the grantings for uh, zoning map amendment and as Ms. Antol had mentioned, our project does meet those findings. And as um, you're aware, the project location is in the east region of Flagstaff off of Cortland Boulevard, Continental Country Club and Cortland Boulevard. We did talk about the Suburban Activity Center, so I'm gonna um, jump through past that slide. And we did talk a little bit about the transportation and circulation that we would be um, constructing a cul-de-sac. That would be one of the improvements in dedicating that right away. Um, I'd like to go over the parking a little bit here in greater detail. So one of the things that we added um, in addition is we ad added more bicycle covered parking. So originally our project had only required 15. We had 16 uncovered parking. We added an additional eight covered parking spaces to the project. So that's one thing that we're gonna be doing above and beyond. Um, and then at the end of the presentation, I'll be doing a summary of those items as well. But in addition, um, we are also are gonna be doing four EV ready parking spaces and installing two charging stations for our project. We talked about the site analysis with Ms. Antal, so I'm gonna go past that as well and the stormwater and <clears throat> management. Here I'd like to um, focus a little bit on this slide. 
So Ms. Um, Antle mentioned that our project requires off-site sewer improvements. So I prepared this map here that shows um, how far we actually have to construct these off-site sewers. It goes all the way from our project here at the north, all the way down across the city of Flagstaff parcel, um, back onto private property, all the way down, and this is where the, the start, actually, of the sewer construction is. We're gonna be starting downstream. And so this is over half a mile of off-site sewer that our project will be responsible for in order to construct our project. So it, it doesn't have anything to do with our project, but it's a requirement for our approval. So I wanted to point that out that uh, Miramonte is, is happy to move forward with that to provide a public benefit. This will provide a benefit to the adjacent residents. They currently have a sewer system that's an eight inch private sewer. We're gonna be upsizing that to 10 inch. So this is a great public benefit for the adjacent residents as well as the city of Flagstaff because my understanding that is an older uh, sewer main that is, is um, having some issues. So we're gonna be correcting those. I'd like to present um, a rendering of what we're proposing to develop. As Ms. Antle had mentioned, that our, um, our project is a similar to like a townhome style. It does fit in line with existing, um, the existing development, the existing apartment complex. And our project is more of an apartment home with a loft style feel. So it's got an artsy feel to it, very modern in nature. Um, these will all be two stories, but we'll have a bedroom on the bottom level of, of every unit. So these will be ADA accessible units to anyone who wants to live in this community. Um, <clears throat> and then also the exteriors, we're going to be featuring the, a variety of different siding. Uh, we'll have board and batten, corrugated metal, and different roof lines for architectural interest. Each unit will have its own AC, a storage unit, as well as a covered fence and patio. And this patio would be able to be used for additional bike storage as well as the, the storage units that are available on site. So people, uh, residents, will be able to park their own bicycles at their units and, and have that additional bike storage. These units will all be energy smart, as Ms. Antle had mentioned. They will all be Energy Star certified and include energy efficient features and appliances, including LED interior and exterior lighting and the use of open cell foam insulation in the attics and walls. Low VOC and formaldehyde free materials will be used for the carpets, cabinets, and paints. And we will be complying with all outdoor lighting and building standards um, through the development to make it dark uh, sky compliant. <clears throat> we really focused on um, a sustainable development here. Uh, as I mentioned, our her score will, um, we're going to be doing the Energy Star efficient appliances, as well as our, our her score will be 58. This will reduce, or below, excuse me, below 58, and we're going to be reducing the cost of energy bills. This will make our project 42% more efficient than a standard home, which is an annual energy savings of 77%. This will reduce waste by promoting recycling. And we're gonna be doing all electric appliances. We're also um, looking at doing an all electric project. So when we had um, negotiated the development agreement, initially we were saying that we would just do um, all electric appliances and probably gas furnaces. We are exploring doing an all electric development. So um, I just wanna let you know that right now with our building plans, that is what we're moving forward with. And we still have to explore that. So at this time, I'm not able to 100% commit to an all electric development, but I can tell you that we are working towards that. And then as I mentioned before, we're gonna be providing four um, EV ready spaces and two EV charging stations. Um, we did talk about the landscaping, how our project's going to be complying with all landscaping standards. I'd like to mention that we are going to have over 1.75 acres preserved on site. And um, the requirements of the resource protection overlay required that we had 50% tree resources preserved. We are preserving over 60% on our project. So that's above and beyond as well on our project. And we're going to be implementing additional sustainable measures as far as rainwater harvesting and also um, installing plants that are native and drought tolerant. 
Um, we also are going to be doing a butterfly garden. I understand the council's changed since that uh, mayor's monarch butterfly pledge, but it's still an important aspect to incorporate into our community and focus on those pollinators to promote pollinators um, and continue, continue to help that, um, that animal community. Um, we're going to be also doing an amenity of a dog park on site. And as Ms. Antall had mentioned, we have the urban trail, which will be a concrete trail that will extend to the over 70 acres of open space. Um, so our project is also voluntarily offering 14 units as affordable. And these will be, deed, or, I'm sorry, income restricted, rental housing for households earning on an average up to 80% of the area median income as defined by the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. Uh, no single household exceeding 100% of AMI. These are gonna be permanently affordable for 30 years according to Flagstaff zoning code. The number and size of the affordable units will be in proportion to the units in the project. Affordable units shall be scattered throughout the development to the extent feasible. And then our property manager that we're gonna be hiring will be monitoring and administrating this program. It will be overseen by the city of Flagstaff and we won't be doing any short-term rentals um, we'll have a minimum of 60 a day leases and we'll also have recertification annually. So I'd like to real quick um, just summarize some of the items that have gone above and beyond the zoning code. So we talked about bike parking. According to the zoning code, 5% uh, of our project was required to have bicycle parking. That would have been 14 and a half or round up to 15. Um, this is a requirement for approval. We elected to have 16 uncovered and eight covered spaces, which is an 8% of the required vehicle parking spaces of 290. And this meets the council goals here um, that I've listed, as well as the general plan goals. Affordable housing. So affordable housing is an incentive. So in the... the Thank you. I uh, move to uh, extend the time for our applicant for another 10 minutes. Do you want a second? Yes, I'll need a, a formal vote to continue. For another 10 minutes? Yeah. Do you need 10 more minutes? I, I <laughs> probably need five or less, but they, I'll take the 10 <laughs> for questions. And then okay. we can add questions. We can add questions for the that. next section. So seconded by Shimoni. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Um, the affordable housing. Oh, sorry, uh, any opposed? That motion carries. <laughs> Please go ahead. I was going to go. I was like, I'm, I'm going. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, yep. Council. Um, so the affordable housing incentive, it, it's, as I mentioned, it's an incentive program, right? So a developer um, isn't required to offer affordable housing to receive a rezone. That's actually, um, it's a voluntary option. It's um, not mandatory, and that would be against the Arizona state law. So there's variety of different incentives that a developer could take if they offered affordable housing. Um, I'd like to mention that Miramonte projects, we didn't take any incentives. We voluntarily offered 10% of our project um, to be permanently affordable for 30 year years. And again, here's the council goals and general plan goals that it meets. EV ready parking, according to the city code, uh, for our parking, number of parking spaces that we have, we were required to do three EV parking spaces. Um, we decided to do four and also install two EV install stations, which is above and beyond the zoning code. Sustainable building, this is also an incentive where you could receive density bonuses. We did not take any incentives, but we voluntarily offered our project to be all electric appliances. And as I mentioned previously, are considering doing an all electric development. Um, again, meets all of your council goals as well as general plan goals here. Offsite and infrastructure, um, this was a required requirement of our approval for our development, but I'd like to mention again, this is a, a very extensive offsite requirement of over half a mile of offsite sewer that we're going to be doing. Foots, um, we're going to be upsizing or, uh, excuse me, we're going to be exceeding the requirements by doing a concrete foots, which the standards did not require a concrete foots on that. Um, open space, we're preserving more open space than was required. I mentioned we're gonna be doing 60% tree resources preserved. And then of course our landscaping, we're gonna be following drought tolerant uh, sustainable practices there. 
And so I just thank you for your time. As I've demonstrated, our project does meet the requirements for granting a zoning map amendment, and we're really excited to get going and, and build it for the community. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, uh, just so I know for next stages, do we have any public comments on uh, this as of yet? No, Mayor, we do not. All right, well, I'm happy to have counsel for uh, questions, comments of either staff or the applicant. Uh, Councilmember Sweet. Thank you, thank you for the presentation, and I think this is a great infill project. Um, a couple of comments, and then I'll ask a couple of questions. Um, with the public outreach, it's a bummer that no one showed up, and I'm just wondering if maybe in the future we change how the outreach is done so that we get some community involvement um, and maybe, I don't know, not cancel the second meeting and do another try for that. Um, and comment-wise, I would love to see this project as our shining example for our sustainable um, building projects. And I love that you're considering going all electric. I, I truly hope that that can happen. Of course, I would like to see solar on that all-electric project. And I just think it would be so great to have this be the example that we could show other projects how it's done. Um, questions. I'm wondering if the dog park can be open to the public and would that make sense? Council Member Sweet, thank you so much for your, your comments and your question. Um, if I may address some of those comments that you had real quick. So we did actually do an extensive outreach. Um, I had, the code requires that you mail to the owners within a vicinity of 300 feet. We expanded that to 600 feet for the property owners, but I went one step far, further. I sent notifications to every single tenant within the area. So there were over 500 tenants that were notified. I worked with Bella Property Management. So the, the neighbor or the adjacent uh, tenant, I'll say, that had complained that she didn't see the notification, she actually made that comment because she did receive the notification of the meeting. So we did do an extensive outreach. There just wasn't an interest, unfortunately. Um, regarding the um, question, which I, I'm sorry, your question again, please. Can the dog park be open to the public? Um, I think we would have to, the public would be likely the adjacent rentals, which I'll tell you, um, Cortland Terrace, they share a dog park with the development just south of that. Uh, our property manager is gonna be Bella, Bella Property Management. So I think it, it might make sense if the adjacent residents were able to use that to open up to the entire general public, um, I think would be a maintenance issue for our project and for, uh, it would be a cost issue. But I think to bring it up to allow adjacent rentals, that might be something that we would be open to because we would be working with them anyways. I would love if you would look into that. Okay. Um, also, with the pollinator garden, I, I appreciate that you all are doing that. I think that's wonderful. And I'm just wondering if there's room to maybe add just a small community garden or maybe infrastructure to have, have that. And I'm talking small, but it could be something to offer. I would have to look in, with our engineering um, because this site is pretty maxed out. So I'm not sure if that's a possibility or not. The only area that we were able to maybe even look at any additional gardens would be in that north section where the trees are being preserved and that just won't work. So I'm not sure if there's anywhere on site that is actually a possibility, but we can, we can consider that before the next meeting. Thank you, and my last question, how are you going to promote the recycling? Oh, you know, I actually, I did have a slide on that, um, but so I'll just uh, summarize this real quick. So part of our materials management, we have a materials management plan. Um, with our property manager, we're gonna be 
um, promoting recycling and giving them information upon lease sign-in. And so they'll have information on what can and what can't be recycled. They'll also have information if they want to um, participate in local valet services, which I did look into. A lot of these companies, they don't have the capacity to do like an entire development. But if someone what is interested in doing that, they could reach out and have that service available. Um, we are also going to be doing um, recycling during our construction. So we're going to be really focused on trying to provide recycling during that construction period. Great, thank you for all of your information and, and I just appreciate the, the details. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember McCarthy? Well, thank you. A couple of my comments slash questions have already been covered, but I just wanted to make sure I got it straight. The parcel to the east is, uh, what is that zone for? Maybe Tiffany would know. The parcel to the east is um, City of Flagstaff and don't remember the zoning on that. I'd, you know, I might actually have a zoning map. Here comes Tiffany. It's, it's got a mix on it. It has some of that research and development on it, as well as RR. So, and am, am I correct that, the, that there's a road on the north side of this development that will get you over to that east parcel? Is that correct? So, there isn't currently. Um, we but will, there'd be an there'd be a uh, easement for it. We will be getting a right of way, a forty-five foot right of way. Okay. But it's unimproved. That's fine. Uh, parcel East Park, and you mentioned something about a park. That there might be a park to the west in the future. To the east, the city is intending to use that seventy acres. The plan has been that same parcel we've been talking about might be used for a park. That's correct. Yeah, I, I guess the only concern I have about this project is when we start using um, light industrial land, which is pretty rare in this city, um, that it's rare and, and, and we're, you know, we need to save that where we can. On the other hand, we have a housing shortage. So I'm gonna, you know, I'm supportive of this project, but I will say that that is a concern when we're getting rid of the light industrial that we may need in the future someday, but. The only thing I would add to that is most of the light industrial in the city is protected by being in the employment category of the regional plan. Okay. Um, and this particular location does not have that same layer of protection. So it's a little bit different. And I have a feeling that the, the reason that was done was because of that multiple split zoning, the access road, um, just that general location of it, while being located next to I-40 would be good for industrial, it's being um, sort of mixed in amongst commercial hotels and other multifamily development. It makes it a little bit tough um, with light industrial. All right, good comments. Um, uh, Charity, you, you uh, touched on um, recycling. Just to clarify, when this project's done, you're going to have um, trash containers, but you're also going to have recycling containers. Is that correct? Thank you for asking that question, because after I mentioned it, I realized I had left out some important details, and we will have trash and recycling receptacles and signage on our, our uh, recycling receptacles so people can know, because it gets confusing. People don't know. They think they can throw glass in the recycling, and they can't, so we'll be doing that as well. Okay, and my last point. Are these units going to have sliding glass doors? I'm not sure. Right now, we are actually in the um, plan stage, so we're actually preparing those building plans. As Tiffany had mentioned, we are doing the same project over on McMillan Mesa. So that's kind of been our, our first project. That didn't have to have a rezone, so that's why you didn't see it come to you. Um, but we're actually preparing those building plans right now, so we'll be um, submitting those soon. They may, I'm not sure if they're going to be ha have sliding glass. Well, I just say that the uh, house plans that I copied when I built my house had a sliding glass door, and I took that out because that's a lot of glass and that's a lot of lost energy. So I'm not going to say this formally, but informally, I would encourage you to not put in sliding glass doors. They're just, uh, the other thing is the snow comes right up to them. Uh, there's a lot of reasons that they're really not a good solution. Anyway, um, 
that's all my questions, comments, and I am supportive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Schmoney. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chair D, for your presentation, Tiffany, as well. And Whitney, welcome. Uh, wonderful project. This is really exciting. You know, I'm, I'm really impressed. Uh, I love that we're integrating rain, rainwater harvesting, affordable housing, a, a whole bunch of things that, you know, are really, I think, in the lines of the priorities and values of the council and the community. So um, it tells me that you all are listening and, and that you're also doing your best to, to uh, please the, the community and the council here, along with building very needed housing. So uh, I too, Councilmember McCarthy had issue, concerns about the, the zoning that we're losing here. And uh, I do wonder, you know, I don't know. It is, it's a hard call. But I think given that this parcel is, is funky and, and like how badly we need housing, I do see value in this rezone uh, consideration. Um, like Councilmember Sweet, I also had a lot of concern when I saw that that second meeting was canceled. Uh, are we posting these meetings to social media? Um, that's not a requirement of the zoning code, and so no, we did not do that. Okay, so I think this comments for Tiffany and our team, you know, moving forward, from my perspective, rather than canceling a very important public opportunity, we, we further double down and try to do a little bit more outreach, although Trudy, I did hear you loud and clear that you all went above and beyond, and I appreciate that. I think that's wonderful. And maybe there really is low interest in this parcel and in this project, but, but I think social media is an easy way to kind of expand that net and, and engage more of the community um, through that pro pro public process, uh, even if they don't live adjacent to that parcel. Tiffany. Um, and I also think this is the third development proposal on this project, and there have been multiple other neighborhood meetings in the past. So sometimes we reach a point of fatigue as well in trying to engage the public. The third time's the charm, right? And we're moving forward, let's hope. So, so this is kind of the time where we, we need them to potentially, but I, I hear you, I do. Um, and then, Council Marcy, I also agree it'd be great to find a way to either you know, make that dog park more accessible and then also that community garden space. And you know, I'm thinking like, I heard what you said in response regarding the space and the, you know, how are we gonna negotiate where that would be. Take a couple darn parking spots. You know, I don't know if that's a decision that we can make as a council, but I think there's a lot of parking here. I was a little bit bummed that you all didn't take us up on an incentive to reduce your parking requirement. And I almost want to just give you a discount just because I don't want to see that much parking created. <laughs> um, really, do I have the opportunity to say that? So thank you. <laughs> but uh, in all seriousness, though, I I'm not sure, Mayor, if we're able to negotiate you know, a few spots that could be converted to a community garden space. Is that something that we can do? I don't, I would look towards your planning manager. Sir, I mean, we yeah. do meet the minimum requires of the parking of 290 spaces, so I don't know, um, I, I wouldn't be able to answer that, but I do have a question. Um, if your priorities are more towards a community garden, would you rather have a community garden than a pollinator garden? Because we have space there, we know we do have space there. So as we're analyzing this site with our engineers and if there's just no more space and we can't reduce parking, we can't you know, amend the site plan, um, would you rather have a community garden versus a pollinator garden? And my follow-up with, with to that would be, do you, can you give us the size of the pollinator garden? The pollinator is 1,900 square feet approximately. What's that in terms of width and length? Um, let me go to that slide so you can kind of see where we're planning it. Because I will say as you're doing that, I do see a lot of value in that pollinator garden and I'd, I'd hate to see us lose that because I do think that's a huge one yeah. option too it could be maybe you do a pollinator garden on the north side and then on the south side you do a small um, community garden so right now we're showing that the butterfly garden as we're calling it um, is in two locations on the north and the south side of the project so maybe that's an opportunity if we can't uh, fit an additional garden on site maybe there's would you be open for that? Would you like that to have two different gardens? I'd be open to that. And I guess my question for Tiffany is, could we reduce the parking um, and potentially convert that to a gar garden space? 
Um, thank you. Uh, so the applicant could take advantage of the 5%. That's the only um, incentive they have available to them for bicycle parking. Um, they're not within the walking distance quarter mile. I haven't measured it. I, of the bus parking? Yeah. Are we, we are about a mile and I would say half a mile. So we won't meet that qualification. It needs to be quarter mile walking distance to this bus stop. Um, they can go. So the trick about our code is, is that it requires you by sidewalk to be able to get. You can you can definitely cut across quicker. But so we but we can't offer them that reduction. So five percent is about what we can reduce. Otherwise, we could look at going through a variance process with the Board of Adjustment to reduce parking. 5% of, what was it, 200 spots? 5% of 290. So like 10 basically spots, and that's something they qualify for today? They are, they could qualify for the 5% reduction of parking spaces, I haven't calculated it. Charity, let's do it. <laughs> what do you think? Um, I think we still need to analyze this with our engineering team to see how that changes the overall site. So we're, we'll definitely investigate that um, before the next meeting to see if that's feasible or not. Or as we had mentioned, there could be those other options, right? We could do the north side or the south side is maybe a butterfly garden and then also incorporate possibly a, a smaller community garden. Okay, well I, would, I guess I would support either, but um, if you do need the space and, and removing the parking is uh, advantageous for you all, I definitely support you taking that 5% opportunity, um, but I'll let you decide that. But yeah, I would support a, a garden on either option that we discussed. And then um, the integration of solar, if there's any possible integration at all on this facility, I, I, I personally would also highly appreciate that. Um, and then I just wanna say thank you for your efforts around the short-term rentals, uh, the sewer replacement line, that's much appreciated. And, and then in, in regards to the brick walkway that was shown on the images um, in one of the slides, I, I've just seen brick around this community over the years of, of freeze and thaw just become a nightmare for folks who might be on a, in a wheelchair or struggle with movement. And so I'm just wondering, um, is that something that could potentially be just pavement and just kept simple for the sake of resiliency of a smooth pathway? So I'll tell you right now, it's interesting. On some of the projects we've been doing, we've done pavers and other projects we've done concrete. And um, right now, because we have such short, a shortage of materials, we've kind of gone back and forth between what works and what we're able to get. And so um, I don't know right now what is, um, available as far as supplies that are readily available, but our project, obviously, we're not gonna be doing vertical construction uh, within the next six months, likely. Um, but I think if you would prefer to do concrete, I think we could certainly accommodate that. I'm pretty sure that's cheaper too, um, but I think that would help individuals who might need that accessibility. So I would really appreciate that. Sure. Um, and then lastly, I, I, again, I really appreciate the affordable housing consideration. And um, gosh, I, I wanna jump back to FOOTS and just say thank you for doing a, a pay FOOTS. That means a lot to the council and to myself. I know that that's a financial consideration that was made. Um, but in regards to the affordable housing component, um, 30 years permanently affordable, is there any way to bump that up to 60 years? Um, council member Shimoni, we have explored this um, and our management company it feels comfortable with 30 years. That's according to the zoning code, and we feel comfortable with offering a 30-year. The project, uh, as you know, sometimes these projects, we need financing or we do a refinance, and we feel comfortable that uh, an investor would find value in this project as we've prepared it, as we've um, negotiated it with staff at this time. So I think we're, com we're comfortable with 30 years. So I'm hearing 45 is the compromise. <laughs> I'm partially messing, but if that was possible, obviously every year counts for affordable housing. We know that when things are at the market rate, locals really struggle to afford it. So I'm just trying to advocate for locals who, who are really struggling. And I know that that's a passion of your all's as well, but I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you, Mayor and Council, and thank you so much, Charity. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Council Member Shimoni. There's uh, Council Member McCarthy. 
Just a, a quick comment to reiterate what Mr. Shimoni said, because <clears throat> I feel strongly about it. The, uh, what you've agreed to on short-term rentals, very important. Thank you. Thank you. Others? Then, Council Member Salas? Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, you know, I take um, rezoning light industrial and R&D to um, HR, high density residential, very seriously because once we we give up once we um, uh, give away the light industrial zone we cannot take it back um, however I'm very mindful of our uh, housing emergency and also recognize and I've been actually in the site I have visited the site two years ago um, when I toured uh, properties of uh, parks, recreation, and open space. So I recognize that uh, this is uh, an appropriate uh, land use because there's already residential in the areas. Um, so could you just uh, go back to the, yeah, that, map, but the bigger one. Uh, could you show me the 45 foot right of way that was uh, presented by Ms. Antle earlier? Council Member Okay. Salas, it's um, right here on this screen. Okay. You see the depiction here? This is that 45-foot right away. So, and, and, that's, and that's parallel to I-40, right? That's Sorry. correct. Okay. And then on the west side is the city, city parcel. Um, east side is oh, city. East side. So, east side is the yeah, city parcel. Yeah, this is the city parcel. And this parcel here will be retained by the seller as highway commercial. So you see it over here on this side. Okay. Yeah. And I, I am also appreciative and um, acknowledge deeply your, your voluntary um, offering of the, the community benefits, like the right of way and the over half a mile of um, underground uh, infrastructure for, for sewer. So have you ever calculated, and you can present this in the next meeting, I just want to have like a dollar amount, total value on your total offering in terms of community benefits. Um, we have looked at the cost of the offsite sewer um, that's going to be in the upwards of over five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars. That's an old estimate, by the way. I don't have a new estimate. I'm actually looking at getting that right now. Um, so that's a substantial cost. Um, the additional uh, costs for doing all electric. Uh, I don't have those those calculations. Um, it is substantially an increase to do a 10 foot wide foot. So we could probably figure out what that additional cost is. Um, adding, you know, EV, additional EV uh, spaces and the charging stations themselves. The infrastructure for a parking space for an EV park, just one, um, is up over $50,000. I mean, so that's just for the infrastructure. And then you add on top of that the actual stations, and those are, they range, but usually the middle, minimal range um, unit is about $12,000. And so it's not, it's not cheap, I should say. All these things add to the project, and so when we're looking at workforce housing, um, all these things add up, and so it makes it difficult to offer a project that serves the workforce in general and keep rents low when you have all these added costs onto a project. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and I, I totally understand that. I, what I am requesting, perhaps at, at the March 15 meeting, is for, for, for your company to present to us, like, 
evaluation of all these benefits that you're bringing to the project, uh, including you know the right of way, the the the, um, the sewer, sewer in infrastructure, all the sustainable, um, mindful sustainability efforts that you are um, bringing in, and and it all adds up. And I just want to have a grip of the dollar amount of the, the total value of the community benefits that you are bringing to the project. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. I'd just like to echo the thanks that have been um, uttered here tonight for, for um, listening to and anticipating what our community needs and presenting a project that um, meets so many of those needs. And if council is okay with this, I would like to move that. Oh, do we have to close the yes, public hearing? Yes, I need hearing? to close the public hearing. And I got, I got a couple comments as well. So <laughs> I appreciate it. You'll, you'll get first dibs when it comes time. Um, yeah, I just would like to say thank you. This, this really is a project that is what we continue to, en to envision on how our city is going to be moving forward. This, uh, I particularly appreciate the all-electric aspect of this. The dog park, I mean, talk about, hey, this is for locals, right? <laughs> Having a dog park right there is, is uh, really great. And I'll just uh, mention that with the, because there's some discussion about the pollinator garden versus the community garden. And however, however council would like, but I really want at least part of that as a pollinator garden. I think those areas in our town are, though, Community gardens are also needed. I think it, it, it's going to be important for wildlife and for um, also our mission. So uh, I appreciate that add-in into the project. Um, aside from that, I am happy to uh, close off my commentary and just, just wanted to share my appreciation. Councilmember Shimoni. I moved. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, Mayor, I just wanted to ask for clarity from council. You know, I think we've heard from three in support of, of, a, of a community garden, potentially on either the south side of the pollinator garden option and or maybe part of the parking trade-off, your decision. Um, are there other, is there a fourth council member that's open to the south pollinator garden being converted to a, a community garden for that region? the area. I'm seeing a thumbs up from Okay, so Councilor there is McCarthy. council majority. Um, so. That's all. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And and Mr. I'll, Mr. I'll... Mayor and, and um, Council, council Member Shimoni, this is Sterling. Just really quickly on that, while there might be a majority of council, that would be something you need to work with the uh, developer on. It's, I, I, if you're going to incorporate that into a motion after the public hearing is closed, that's one thing but it's not just direction that can be given. It's negotiated with the developer. I just wanted to point that out. Thank you, Thank Sterling. You. And, and Charity, my understanding is that you were kind of asking us for our feedback. Um, does that give you clarity on, I guess, what the council would desire? Yes, thank you. And hopefully that's okay, Sterling. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, yeah. Thank I don't, you, sorry for the interruption. Thanks. No, I appreciate the clarification. I don't think that needs to be really added into a motion, just you're, you're getting the feel for where we're at. <laughs> so that's good, and I appreciate it. Got it. No, uh, I got it. Thank you. Awesome. Well, uh, with that, I am willing to close the public hearing and kick the, kick the can here to Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. I move that we read ordinance number 202205 by title only for the first time. All second. I have a motion by Vice Mayor, seconded by Council Member Sweet. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries unanimously. City Clerk. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Flagstaff amending the Flagstaff zoning map to rezone approximately 13.49 acres of real property generally located at 5531 East Cortland Boulevard, APN 112-37-001E, from the Highway Commercial HC, Light Industrial Open, LI-0, 
or O, sorry, and research and development RD zones with a resource protection overlay RPO to the highway to the high density residential HR zone with a resource protection overlay RPO providing for severability, authority for clerical corrections, and establishing an effective date. Thank you, City Clerk. With that, then, uh, I think we'll take a short break before we get into uh, agenda item 12A. Thank so, you, Council. Thank you. Um, so let's just do 11 minutes. So 725, we can reconvene here. All righty, are we good on tech front? We are good to go. Streaming of the live. All righty. We are down to agenda item 12A. This is our regular agenda. Consideration and adoption of ordinance number 2022-06, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Flagstaff, authorizing the City of Flagstaff to accept a donation of 0.29 acres of vacant land along the west side of Schweitzer Canyon Drive. Parcel number 101-29-050, track to E. Delegating authority to complete the transaction, providing for repeal of conflicting ordinances, severability, authority for clerical corrections, and establishing an effective date. Staff recommended action is to read ordinance number 2022-06 by title only for the first time. All right. Take us away. Oh, you're still muted there. Still muted. Oh. oh, heard you for a sec there. If you wanted to turn off your... Air Council, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. You're kind of choppy. If you want to turn off your video, it might be easier to to hear you. Are, are you uh, messaging? Can Mayor and Council, can you hear me now? Yes, I'm doing better now. I'm sorry. So we can hear you better. I'm now. gonna go ahead and leave, I'm gonna go ahead and leave off my camera if that's okay with you. I'm having internet issues. Uh, perfectly fine. Thank you. Thank you. I'll start over again. Good evening, Mayor and Council. My name is Carmen Pryor. I'm the real estate specialist for the city of Flagstaff. The city was approached by Mr. Howell Usher, who asked to be addressed for this presentation as Howie who has graciously offered a donation of 0.29 acres of vacant land along the west side of Schweitzer Canyon Drive to the city of Flagstaff. This item was presented to the, to the city's property and development team and city staff determined this property to be a great fit for public use. I'm bringing forward this ordinance for acceptance of this donation. I'd like to give a little background on Howie. How he came to Flagstaff to work for the Museum of Northern Arizona in 1977. He completed his master's degree in aquatic biology at NAU. He worked for Stephen W. Carruthers Associates as a field ecologist. And since 1979, he worked as a commercial river guide for First Wilderness World and then Arizona Raft Adventures until his retirement in 2019. With regret, Howie is not able to attend this meeting tonight, and I will read a short statement on his behalf. I am grateful I can contribute to a city that has been a significant part of my life for more than 35 years. I hope this small strip of nature will have a positive impact on the community. Thank you for accepting my gift, Howie Usher. Mayor and Council, I can answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Carmen. Um, Council, any questions? Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so in conversations with staff, uh, did was it discussed what this land would be used for or how it would be maintained? Um, 
I guess those are my questions, yes. what it would be used for and how it would be maintained. Vice Mayor, thank you for the question. Um, yes, the use would be either for possibly a foot trail or a sidewalk leading up Schweitzer Canyon and uh, maintained would be by I, I believe it was streets and parks, but I'm not 100% positive. Bryce? Hi, Carmen. This is Bryce Doty, real Hi. estate manager. Um, you're correct. So we're accepting this property, as you can see, this, this blue shape here on the edge. Because of the existing grade, um, we would like to add sidewalk on this side and the existing uh, oh, amount of right-of-way that we have is probably not gonna be enough because of the existing grade. So by accepting this, we are essentially um, giving us a lot of design flexibility to install those sidewalks when the appropriate time and funding uh, become available. That's excellent, thank you, Mr. Dodian. Thank you, Kurtman. Uh, any other um, questions or comments from council? Well, please afford our sincere appreciation and thanks to Howie. And I'm um, looking forward to seeing the ability for more bike ped in that area. I know it can be uh, a little hairy at times on that section. So uh, thank you for really thinking about our, our city, our, our public safety. And um, it is very much, very much appreciated. Thank you. All right, with that, I move to read ordinance number 2022-06 by title only for the first time. I'll second that. Seconded by Council Member McCarthy. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries unanimously. City Clerk. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Flagstaff authorizing the City of Flagstaff to accept a donation of 0.29 acres of vacant land along the west side of Schweitzer Canyon Drive, parcel number 101-29-050, tract E, delegating authority to complete the transaction, providing for repeal of conflicting ordinances, severability, authority for clerical corrections, and establishing an effective date. Thank you, City Clerk. That brings us down to uh, agenda item 13, our future agenda item requests. Uh, these both are from me. The first 13A is a uh, request by myself to place on a future. Oh, Sterling. Oh, thank you, Mayor. I Voice from on high. Here. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> My apologies. I, I was going to jump in. I appreciate that, Councilmember Salas. Mayor and Council, I just wanted to make you all aware. I, I know the mayor is going to introduce these two fairs. Um, there will be, if there is support to move forward with a discussion of these, uh, as well as some other fairs that are in the fair hopper right now, uh, I, I just want to give you advance notice that there will be an executive session if um, Council wants to move forward with any further discussion on both of these ones tonight as well as some others that you'll see in future meetings. But uh, I just want to make sure you're aware of that going into it. Thank you. Thank you, Sterling. So uh, 13A is a request to place on a future agenda discussion regarding like legal violations of permittees as grounds to suspend or terminate building permits or public construction contracts. I will mention that both of these actually came are kind of uh, came out of our discussion regarding prevailing wage a few months ago, where it did seem that certain parts of it that council would maybe like to have further discussion on, despite not uh, being fully on board with the whole big part that we were discussing with it. So these really are spinoffs that uh, hopefully uh, we can have a discussion with in the future, see what the legal legalities are, and um, hope we'll get on board and we can discuss, but uh, uh, we do have a speaker request on this item that I'd like to get to. Um, Matt Capalbi, if you'd like to come on up. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Pleasure to be here this evening. Um, 
do want to take an opportunity uh, to uh, thank you for uh, considering this, uh, Mayor, and for presenting it uh, for a discussion item that we can work on over the upcoming months and how to address a lot of these issues and concerns. Um, especially here in Arizona, there's a, we have a very uh, pervasive and actually somewhat even dangerous uh, precedent that's going on in, in uh, both public and private jobs, and that's cash pay tax fraud. One of the reasons why we were discussed prevailing wage previously is because when you have a prevailing wage, you have a certified payroll that everyone on a particular job does have the license, licensing and requirements necessary to do that work. Um, but what we've seen here because of the legislature's kind of fast and loose interpretations of a lot of regulations and laws, we've seen an explosion in uh, tax fraud and cash pay. What used to be a one-off when you had a contractor buddy come by your house on the weekend to do the cabinets in your kitchen um, has now become practically the industry norm to where you just pay him cash on the side as a side hustle. Now that's practically normal. And we've seen um, uh, a growth in a particular job field or market called labor brokers. A lot of the time labor brokers is just another word for a coyote or human trafficker. Um, what these uh, labor brokers do uh, is they'll go out and recruit labor, of course, uh, often, unfortunately, undocumented, exploited people that are in uh, bad situations, or a lot of the time, to people that are trying to stay under the radar. They don't want to pay their child support or they're trying to avoid uh, getting caught uh, because they're on disability or uh, you know, alimony, whatever the case is. So they, they accept cash on, on the jobs. We recently documented a City of Phoenix uh, public housing project where the majority of the laborers on site were being paid cash by labor brokers. And it's a very diffused issue and system to where enforcement is very problematic. You have the Department of Revenue, the Industrial Commission, the Registrar of Contractors, the uh, Department of Insurance all have little pieces of this, but it never rises to being a priority. So now it's, it's so easy to do. We have many of our members who have been in the construction industry for, for decades and they... Well, uh, thank you, Mr. I'm Capalbi. Uh, but okay. could, could you tell us a little bit about the experiences of your members uh, yes. as you were stating? I, I apologize, thank you. Um, too, I forgot about the timer. Uh, what we've seen is, especially at the city of Phoenix job, we actually had people go in with camera phones and interview these people on site saying, yeah, I'm getting $15 an hour, 60 hours a week, straight cash, um, too. And this was a publicly funded project, uh, to the mayor of Phoenix, uh, and the, the council there have taken measures, uh, in conjunction with the general contractors association. Uh, that we, we work with um, to help crack down on this issue because it really helps or uh, is very problematic when it comes to legitimate business that tries to do everything the right way, to pay their taxes, pay their insurance, pay the, uh, their disability. Uh, that's all required uh, by their licensing uh, requirements uh, for construction. So... Uh, I recently sent you, and I shared this, I believe, with the mayor and the vice mayor previously. There's a very concise and direct uh, ordinance out of a community in Indiana called Portage, Indiana. They adopted what's now practically a national model for this particular issue. And it actually puts the enforcement uh, of this issue on the cities, um, too. So what they can do is if you don't have workers that are qualified to be doing the work on a job, public or private, um, to we will suspend your, bu your building permit until you can prove to us that you're paying taxes, you're paying insurance, uh, you're paying your workman's compensation uh, necessary for any particular job. 
we don't necessarily want to go that drastic, right? I think we should start with public projects and then maybe move into uh, private sector. But this is something too that where we come to agreement with our general contractors uh, too because uh, they're seeing a race to the bottom in their profession, in the small businesses too. As I was beginning to say before the timer went off, we have people that want to go out and start their small business. And uh, in order to compete, in order to bid for these projects, they can do their workman's comp and pay their insurance and everything, but then they're going to go out of business because they're having to compete with people that are paying cash. Our union uh, signatory contractors have not bid a public project in seven years. Anywhere in the state, no schools, no cities, anywhere, because they cannot compete with the fast and loose procurement uh, policies from the state of Arizona and many municipalities. So we're working to help address this issue and uh, it's just become a very profound problem. So mm -hmm. I am available for any questions or comments that you may have um, that hopefully we can address uh, this issue uh, that's so pervasive. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. I, I really appreciate it. And um, I just note that, you know, this, this is just to start this discussion tonight and what we're looking for this evening. Yeah. Uh, what I'm, I'm requesting a council to place this on the agenda, do, do more homework on it, uh, because this is a real issue. It affects small businesses. It affects the workers who are there getting paid cash, but now don't have short-term disabilities when they are roofing and have an accident. Or it's, you know, this is some of the most dangerous jobs as well. So this is a way to protect workers, a way to protect small businesses, and to prevent tax fraud in our community around these types of projects. Yeah. Um, so I, I just, well, bit my pitch, but I want to hear from other members of council for questions or comments or any of the sort. And Mayor, if I may, uh, uh, later on, hopefully. Yeah, if we have, if if we we have we, questions, we'd love yeah, to pass, be able to. We'd be more than happy to work with you, present more detailed uh, facts um, and evidence on these matters. Thank you, I so. appreciate it. Councilmember McCarthy. So <clears throat> the goal here is not to say that all the, all the uh, workers have to be union. No. It's, it, it's only to say that they have to be legit, file proper tax returns, et cetera. And, Ab and absolutely. play fair like all of the rest of us do. Right, mm -hmm. that they're qualified to do the work that they're being paid well, to do. What do you mean by, how do you decide if they're qualified? Licensed, licensed and bonded contractors, uh, as per the Registrar of Contractors in the state of Arizona. Um, so I guess I don't understand. If someone wants to do some work in my backyard, uh, theoretically, they're supposed to be licensed? Is theoretically. That ma that's mandatory or just, just that's, good, good That's practice? state law. That's state law. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're supposed to be licensed and bonded to do the work that you're saying to do. And the problem with the labor brokers is that they will bring in workers and they'll say, today, you're a pipe fitter. Guess what? Tomorrow you're gonna be a drywall hanger. Next day, you're gonna be a, a concrete uh, form, uh, form worker. Two, those people are not qualified or capable to do that work. And that's why often, on especially public projects, you see significant change orders after a project is completed because of the lack of uh, quality on the, of the work. I, I will also note too that the uh, ordinance that uh, w was provided as a sample from Indiana was for uh, for div for projects that were over a quarter million a year. So right. this is not somebody you know come to fix you know necessarily the drywall in your wall that you know you have to spend an extra couple grand to do because of flooding issues. Like right, we're and seeing, there'll, there'll be of course significant limitations and qualifications. We don't want to hurt somebody. Again, this just cleaning your yard or cutting down a tree, um, too. That's not who we're after. There's a lot of people that are just trying to put food on their tables, take care of their family. We don't want to go after those people. We want to go after the people that exploit and abuse them mm -hmm. and traffic in them, um, too. That's the, that's the problem. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Vice Mayor. I support having an um, additional discussion Thank you, Vice Mayor. Yep. There's Council Member Schmoney. I too support an additional discussion. Thank you. All right. Uh, Council Member Sweet. I as well support it. 
Thank you. Councilmember McCarthy. I, dis I support um, having discussion on this, um, but I have a lot of questions before I sign up for a final ordinance or something. Right. Certainly. No, we, right. we understand right. and appreciate that. And uh, uh, we're going to, again, bring uh, many people um, and materials uh, for you to review and consider uh, mm -hmm. as we move forward in this process. Thank you, Matt. And we look forward to that. We, we do have council direction on this front. So uh, thank you again. And we will definitely be in touch and learning more on all our fronts. Uh, thank you. Moving forward. Thank you. And then the next uh, future agenda item request uh, is regarding um, a request by myself to place on a future agenda a discussion regarding apprenticeship requirements for public construction contracts. Now, uh, this has been done in, um, well, not, not done as much in Arizona, but uh, it required for just public contracts, not messing with private sector, but that you have a requirement of, for example, 3% or 5% of the workforce on there has to have apprenticeship licensing. So, uh, you know, journeyman apprentices. Uh, so that way we can incentivize and create the workforce development we need in these areas and uh, to ensure we're con furthering the trade skills that provide a large opportunity for people in our community and elsewhere and um, to uh, give people opportunities. These are well-paying types of jobs that uh, can help incentivize, have contractors be recruiting new apprentices, uh, help instill this type of uh, programming. So that's the basic gist behind this future agenda item request. And be happy to see if you'd like to further this discussion at a future agenda. Councilmember Sauce. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for, for uh, um, bringing forward this uh, fair item as um, most of you are aware that I'm already working on establishing uh, an apprentice, a pipe trades apprenticeship training center in Flagstaff and catering to, to Northern Arizona workforce. So this is a good step toward that um, apprenticeship training center for Northern Arizona. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Sauce. Councilor McCarthy. So I'm trying to understand would this rule say that they would have to have apprentices on the job as a way of helping train these apprentices? Or would it be that people that can't work on the job unless they have completed an apprenticeship? No, this is for in the process of apprenticeship. So a lot of these programs, uh, you could speak to the pipe fitting. I know a lot of these are three year, four year programs are basically like a bachelor's degree, but it would be those individuals in that training process would have on site uh, uh, training on public contracts. So and in effect, you're saying that the, the uh, contract companies would have to provide this training in effect, this apprenticeship they would be uh, in the. They would be already in the programs, but uh, council member Salas, you can. So apprenticeship is the next level. For example, let's say welding. Um, so we have a welding program in, in one of our high school, right? So they have the basic knowledge of the welding. The next level is the first level apprenticeship, and each level apprenticeship gets a level of certification, and that uh, that is uh, also. Um, uh, uh, assigned to a specific like salary level. So if you're apprenticeship one, you're you have this pay grade. If you're uh, if you're a welder, you know the different levels. So for example, for for a welding, it's up to five year apprenticeship uh, program. But so they, they so apprenticeship is also on the job training. So they doing the classroom work and the hands on work in in the lab and then work on the job site. So I, I completely understand the concept of apprenticeships and it obviously makes a lot of sense. But what I'm getting at here is this proposal would say that the contractors would be obligated to provide apprenticeships and training for individuals. And it wouldn't be a 
voluntary thing that would be required. I think if we move forward to further discussion, we can, we can tweak that, mm -hmm. that language. It could be like an incentive rather than a requirement. Exactly. So this just broken, br brings up the discussion to incentivize, require. Obviously, we would be getting legal advice on it, but I think it's a great way that with public contracts, especially as we are seeing federal dollars coming potentially, hopefully, into our community through the infrastructure law, this is a great way to tie in that we, as a city, actually now can use public contracts and these, these monies that are available for important things to also simultaneously get apprentices and workforce development in the process. If I also may add something, Mr. Mayor, with, with what is really growing uh, nationwide today in terms of uh, workforce training is strengthening the apprenticeship program. So th uh, the city taking a lead on on um, strengthening apprenticeship program will actually um, empower us to access a federal grants toward this program mm -hmm. through the Arizona at Work and uh, Coconino County Workforce Development Board, as well as other um, federal programs that uh, support apprenticeship programs. And I will mention too that there are other um, municipalities that provide incentives towards this. And it's not just a matter of just apprentices, but you can do the incentives for um, more diversity in the trade skills. You can incentivize, you know, having female apprentices or, um, yeah, more or minorities. So it's a great way to leverage in multiple regards. And um, yeah, Vice Mayor. I support having the discussion. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Council Member Shimoni. I do too. All right. Uh, we do have direction on this item for the for discussion in the future. I, I appreciate uh, you all entertaining these ideas. With that, we are down to uh, agenda item 14. Do we have any general public participants? Not tonight, Mayor. Excellent. And um, then we are down to our two from items of, of council. Um, and uh, I apologize. I, I did not realize, Mr. Capalbi, that this said item 13A and B. So I'm, I'm sorry, I'm used to seeing each card for each agenda item. So you are welcome to have your three minutes to speak to it if you wanted to clarify. And I apologize for oh, yes, enough. Thank you. So thank you, Mayor. I appreciate it. Um, just to let you know, as, as I think uh, Councilwoman Salas uh, has pointed out, uh, workforce development uh, committees around the state are partnering with school districts, community colleges, and municipalities to take the opportunity for public projects to be training grounds for tradespeople. Uh, public money should be spent uh, when we're doing projects on helping develop that workforce that is so desperately needed as we move into the 21st century. And as you pointed out, we have these very significant uh, infrastructure projects coming and we need to have local folks that are qualified and capable to do the work. What better way to do that than to require that uh, trainees and apprentices uh, be uh, on site for these public projects, be it a partnership with a community college, a high school, a union, a private uh, sector, the uh, McCarthy construction, no relation to Councilman McCarthy. Um, well, maybe, I don't, I'm not sure. But uh, they're, uh, we work very closely with them. They're an excellent company, uh, national uh, scale. They have one of the best private uh, apprenticeship programs that we know of. So private and public sector uh, apprenticeship programs we support. As long as we're taking that opportunity to spend our public funds wisely, in developing and training our local folks, and especially our young, uh, local young people as they transition into our workforce. Uh, it's such a great opportunity with some of the programs in the high schools, if we're able to bring some of these young people right out of high school onto the projects where they can get the on-the-job training uh, too. It's not a union versus private sector or anything like that. It's just about workforce development. We have a significant problem, <coughs> excuse me, 
um, in our trades because we are a training ground similar to teachers. In Arizona, they'll get their qualifications, <coughs> excuse me, and then they'll go to Las Vegas, Salt Lake City, Denver, LA, where they could get double. So we're trying to find ways to develop <coughs> the workforce that we can have you know, good, decent paying jobs and keep our young people and families here versus having to move somewhere else once they get those pr professional certificates. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much and good luck to you all. And we're gonna be at your disposal over the upcoming months as we develop these ordinances. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colby. And I apologize again for uh, uh, skipping that over before, the, before we got into the discussion. Um, with that, we are good to go for our uh, info items and we'll start at the opposite side here. So Council Member Salas. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just another um, public service announcement. Uh, please weigh in on the future of uh, what is loosely called as Thor Park Annex. So this is the parcel <laughs> adjacent to Thor Park, which was um, uh, we're taking public, pub, we're in the process of public um, engagement. So I believe there is a Zoom tomorrow night and Saturday morning. So it's on our, it's on our website and our um, Flagstaff City Go Government Facebook page as well. Thank you, Councilmember Salas. Councilmember Sweet. Nothing for me tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember McCarthy. I'll just mention that tomorrow at 10 o'clock in the morning is the uh, Flagstaff Metropolitan Planning Organization meeting. Um, and then at 4 o'clock tomorrow is the Transportation Commission meeting. Thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor. Nothing for me. Thank you. Councilmember Shmoney. How am I always the one that has so much to report on? <laughs> okay, I'm starting to think it's a me thing. Anyways, uh, great meeting. Thank you all. Thank you, staff. Thank you, leadership. I think we, we covered a lot of ground tonight. Uh, City Manager, I just wanted to say that I, I really appreciate to see the evolution of your reports and how it's progressing. I just think is really good, in the for in, especially through the lens of communication and empowerment and recognition. Uh, it's just been a real honor to witness that evolution, and, and that's a direct uh, praise to you as, our, as the one facilitating that. So uh, well done, and I think it means a lot to our employees and to this community. So thank, thank you for all that, and, and for, for allowing Krista to walk, walk around with you and kind of walk in your shoes a little bit. I'm sure it's a very eye-opening experience, and, and I'm grateful that we have a, a culture at the city that allows folks to bounce around like that and learn. This, this is such a great educational opportunity in this building, and, and it takes leadership to allow it to really blossom into the educational potential that it has. So Krista, I love that you're taking advantage of that and you're seeing uh, what our city managers do at the city. So maybe when Greg does move on, someone else will step up. Um, but no time soon. <laughs> Anyways. Don't um, get many ideas, Shemar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so, so thank you, Greg, for your service. No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, just thinking about the COVID discussion, just want to say, you know, it's just a wild thought to think that next week masks will be optional. And uh, it gives me kind of goosebumps and also some hesitation. But, um, yeah, you know, the council member Aslan's point, you know, it, it is a, it's something to celebrate. And the city has done a great job, although I don't think we're through this pandemic. The Omicron variant is in Arizona, the second one, the, the BA2 or whatever it's BA2. called. And uh, basically, uh, it is what it is. But I do think that the city, I'm very proud of the city's efforts. So thank you all. And, and thank you to the city manager and our team and, and our, uh, our city clerks. Oh, my gosh. You all deserve an uh, award for, for your work through this pandemic, seriously. Uh, we'll, we'll circle back to that later. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I was able to witness the last two Lady Eagles high school basketball games, and they were extremely exciting. Again, so proud of that team, that their coaching staff, the school, their families. And I'll tell you that there's a lot of pride mm -hmm. on the reservations and our tribal partners to the north in that team. And, and it's just such a beautiful thing to witness 
that you know, Flagstaff really represents and embraces the cultures of our tribal partners to the north. We, we are an extension of them and vice versa. And it was very, very clear in the basketball support community that showed up for the game in Phoenix and at Flag High last week. Um, and it was just really cool to be a part of that and witness that. And a big congrats on a great, successful season. Last week, I got to do a ride along with our snow operators. And I know, I think Vice Mayor Beckett, Baggy, Beggy, yeah. Beggett. <laughs> it's like, uh, got to have one of those uh, ride along as well. And, and thank you to Sam Beckett, our streets director, and Scott Overton. And, you know, while I'm here talking about this, I also want to give a shout out to our, all of our snow operators and our trash and recycling drivers who helped with snow operations through the last storm and keeping our roads and avenues clear. Um, and on that note, I've been in communication with Boulder leadership learning about their snow operations. And I did learn that they prioritize clearing bike lanes and bike corridors prior to addressing streets. And that to me sounds like a policy discussion that I would love for us to have and I hate to do this to our team, and I'm not going to ask for a fair, <laughs> but uh, I, I am going to ask how do we address that at some point in the coming 10 months. <laughs> but uh, we can circle back to that later and see, manager, maybe we could put our heads together and see how that might fit into something. But to me, that's a policy conversation, and I've, and I've tried to have it over the years, and, and maybe I'll be t successful this time around and feel a new sense of empowerment now that Boulder has kind of communicated that it's possible to put those things first and, and then build from there um, and go from there. Uh, so I, I want to just give a, a shout out to Sarah Langley and Sam who work as our public information officers and they're a team. Uh, we've ha we have a presence on Instagram and it's strong and it's growing and I love all the graphics that they're posting and creating and Sarah's doing a great job really, really impressed and really pleased with their work in communication through social media. And then last week I attended a, a clinic called Let's Fix a Dangerous Street in 24 Hours. Just a couple quick takeaways were that we shouldn't be afraid to demo projects and just do demonstration of projects. That was the big thing was don't be afraid to just try things and engage the community while doing it, include them, embrace them, and, and just try different things. Um, but there's many different approaches and styles, and a lot of them are very affordable. It doesn't cost much money, it's just political will and leadership. And that, that leading through your city engineers and your elected officials was a key point to be successful. And I think, we, I think we're more or less there, <laughs> but those were the key takeaways. And then my last thing there was this uh, earlier, I think at the beginning of the conversation, we talked about commissions and um, that folks can serve on multiple commissions. I did I was find out yeah. <laughs> that <laughs> you can only part. serve on one commission unless you're the representative from that commission to another commission. Folks in the public can only serve on one commission. Um, good meeting, everybody. Thank you. And, and thank you for letting me just be me and, and talk as much as I do. And I do apologize. And I also Boop. don't apologize. Time's up. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> thank you, Council Member. Uh, <laughs> uh, Council Member Aslan. <laughs> Thank you very much. I don't have anything tonight. I look forward to possibly seeing some smiling faces next week. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, just to kind of back up what Shmoni said, I was a little mistaken because we do have some cross. Um, I don't know. Cross pollinators is not the. It's not. <laughs> Going back to the butterfly garden, it's late. Uh, <laughs> but we have like planning and zoning and water commission have a liaison that goes to both. We have it with our um, bike, bike, bike pad with our, anyways, regardless, <laughs> I was a little confused there, but we still need people in a lot of our commissions, not just a, inclusion and adaptive living, but that one, as I'm the liaison for, I'm gonna be, I'm pushing for. But please look on our website. If we could do a post about that too with our social media to give, yeah, make sure that it's uh, for the whole general list. 
I know we've been pushing each specific commission, but there's an easy full list of different things for, um, that you can, vacancies that you can uh, help really support our community because these commissions are vital to what we do up here on council to get their advice, your advice, and make sure that we're uh, representing the people in our community appropriately. So with that plug, uh, I think I'm, I'm done. My brain's done for tonight. So thank you, everyone. Successful meeting, good work, and uh, get some rest. <laughs> meeting adjourned. <laughs>